Vamos. The Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is now in session. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody, and uh, thank you to those uh, who've managed to come to the hearing room today in the face of uh, the rail strike, which uh, is affecting movement in uh, Sydney. Um, we start with an acknowledgement of uh, country. On behalf of the Commission, I wish to acknowledge the Darug people, who are the traditional custodians of the land uh, upon which this hearing is taking place. We pay our respects uh, to their elders, uh, past, present and emerging. We also pay our respects to all First Nations people who may be attending the hearing in person today, uh, as well as those who will be following the hearing on the uh, live stream. Yes, Miss Eastman. Uh, good morning, Commissioners, and good morning, uh, everybody following the Royal Commission proceeding online and in the room. You'll see we've got two witnesses uh, ready to go, but before I introduce them, Commissioners, can I just outline what will happen today? So our first witnesses today will be from the Commonwealth Department of Social Services. And after their evidence, you will have the pre-record that we did with William. I deferred that from yesterday's hearing and we'll play that just before morning tea. Then after morning tea, we'll move to Ms. Dendal from, who is the Acting Executive Director of the New South Wales Department of Community and Justice. And you'll hear her evidence through to lunchtime. Then after lunch, you'll hear from Ms. Short from the NDIA. And then there'll be a further pre-record from Dave. And I understand subject just to the train issues today, Dave might also join us in the hearing room. And commissioners, we plan to adjourn uh, at around 3.30. And uh, the commissioners may be aware, and for those in the hearing room, that the Royal Commission will hold an afternoon tea this afternoon. Uh, and we have invited service providers uh, in the area of Western Sydney who are engaged with working with people who are homeless and housing services to meet the Royal Commission in person. I think everybody is welcome to the afternoon tea. Thank you. All right. Thank you so very much. Um, Ms. Mitchell, welcome back to the Royal Commission. Thank you. Mr. Philobel, welcome to you. Uh, Thank you for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence and thank you for the joint statement which you have uh, provided, which we have read. Uh, just to explain where everybody is, uh, Commissioner Galbally, whom you can see on screen, is joining the hearing from Melbourne and Commissioner Ryan is on my left. Um, if you would be good enough uh, to follow the instructions of uh, my associate who is located over there, he will administer the affirmation or the oath as the case may be. Miss Mitchell, I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. Mr. Flavell, I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by almighty God that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. I'll now ask Ms Eastman to ask you some questions. Thank you. So can I first uh, deal with some introductions? Ms Mitchell, welcome back to the Royal Commission. You've previously given evidence at the Royal Commission at Public Hearing 21 and Public Hearing 22 might need you to say yes, yes rather than not. Yes. And you've provided us statements in relation to both those uh, public hearings. I did. And uh, just for the benefit of people who might be seeing you or hearing you for the first time, you uh, hold the role of Deputy Secretary Disability and Carers in the Department of Social Services. I do. And that's a role that you've held since November 2021. That's correct. Your area means that you are responsible for policies and programs providing targeted supports and services 
for people with disability and their carers. That's correct. And that includes the DSS uh, policy responsibilities in relation to the National Disability Insurance Scheme. That's correct. Okay. And Mr Flavell, welcome to the Royal Commission. Thank you. Um, people always a bit worried when I say that, but <laughs> we'll welcome. Um, so you hold the position of Deputy Secretary, Social Security, also at the department. I do. And what are your particular areas of responsibility in that capacity? So um, it's best thought of as two main responsibilities, one in relation to Social Security policy generally, so advice about the, the facet of payments the Commonwealth makes um, to individuals, and then the other is broadly uh, in relation to the Commonwealth's responsibilities for housing and homelessness, uh, noting that that's a shared responsibility with the Department of Treasury, who also have key responsibilities in relation to housing policy. And that includes the administration of the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement? It does. All right. Now, th together you've prepared a, a joint statement and you say that that has been prepared with the assistance of lawyers and officers in the department. Is that right? Correct. Correct. And you've both had a chance to read the statement before this morning? Yes. yes. Are there any changes that either of you wish to make to any parts of the statement? I... Um... There was one, not a change. Well, sorry, I'll just on page. Sorry, I thought we might get to it during the discussion. On that paragraph 54 mm -hmm. of the statement, there has been um, an update. So, where it says uh, these changes are scheduled to come into effect in September 2022. That's uh, now October 2022, and that's to be rolled out over 12 months, not 18 months. Okay, so the change to that would be to paragraph 54, and this is the fourth sentence, yep. so it should read this. These changes are scheduled to come into effect in October 2022 and to be rolled out over the next 12 months? Correct. And with those changes, uh, do you both say that the contents of the statement are true and correct? Yes. yes. All right. So um, in the time that we've got, we may not be able to cover absolutely every topic in the that you've covered in the statement. And as the chair said, the commissioners have read the statement and the statement will be tendered in due course. But um, I want to start with the uh, relevance of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to the work and the policy development concerning homelessness and housing for the Commonwealth. This is a, a matter that you've dealt with in the statement, and if you want to refer to these parts, you're very welcome to at paragraph 112 and 113. Are we right to understand that for DSS, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability is uh, an important instrument to take into account in the development of policy? It guides the development of our policies. When you talk about guiding the development of the policy, what do you actually mean by guide? So when we, uh, in any development of any policy or any framework, uh, the CRDP, uh, is a, well, it's a guiding factor in that we consider all aspects of the CRDP and make sure that we're adhering to um, the obligations under it for Australia. Well, some might say that as a, a matter of law, that uh, the CRPD has to do more than guide. It creates binding international legal obligations on the department, does it not? And so if uh, the CRPD is guiding policy, is the approach that you're looking to ensure that any policies comply with the CRPD, meet That's those correct. objectives? And uh, to the extent that we just look at the articles in the CRPD, you've referred to Article 19. Yep. And you've referred to Article 28. And Article 28 is a right of persons with disabilities to an adequate standard of living for themselves and their family and that includes adequate living, adequate housing and ad adequate living conditions. Um, when you look at the content of that right, how does that right inform the development of policy? 
So if I can refer to the development of the Australian Disability Strategy, mm -hmm. uh, every aspect of the rights of people with disabilities to live uh, and a fulfilling life uh, and adhere to all of those rights uh, is embedded in every aspect of the strategy and starting with how we actually consulted on the strategy. There was a significant consultation over a two year period with, um, with uh, people with disabilities, with their disability representative organisations. It's actually a, a co-design process that the, uh, the department and my team are incredibly proud of because it was so comprehensive and understanding. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to jump in and interrupt you there. I do want to ask you some okay. questions about the development of the particular strategy, but just generally um, it, looking at these, co these concepts of adequate housing and continuous improvement in living conditions. Um, and I'm sorry if my question wasn't clear, but just how do you actually engage with that right in the development of policy? Do you look, for example, at uh, international examples as to how this works in practice? Do you look at this from a purely legal perspective? Do you think about whether or not uh, policy has to meet certain indicators to achieve what the rights um, directing the Commonwealth to do? I wouldn't like, I, I don't know the complete answer to that question, I have to say, but uh, of course we look at our obligations under the rights and that, that drives every policy we have. And why, why I went to talk about the Australian Disability Strategy is that um, if you look at our statement on at paragraph 114, we talk about governments in Australia. So it is about when we work with governments in Australia about um, those rights and at the strategy at page 55 of the strategy, we talk about the roles and responsibilities of the different governments in Australia. So that's where I was, why I was going down that path. Okay, so in terms of from a Commonwealth thinking, if Australia was to meet its obligations in relation to adequate housing and continuous improvement of living conditions, one aspect of it is not only to focus on the Commonwealth, but also to look to the extent to which the states and territories design their policy to meet those obligations? Well, under um, 114B, we talk about actions under the strategy, which all states and territories and local government have signed uh, for actions under the strategy. And when you're referring to paragraph 114, you say this, governments in Australia, including the Australian government, intend to fulfil their progressively realisable obligations under the CRPD in relation to housing through four areas. Provision of social and affordable housing, action under the strategy, the implementation of the National Construction Code 2022 and the NDIS. Yes. So those would be the sort of four pillars for from the Commonwealth's perspective to meet those obligations under Article 28, and I also take it Article 29. And to do that, that's not just solely the responsibility of the Commonwealth, is that right? That's it has correct. to include the states and territories. All governments have responsibility. And if um, we took the first element, the provision of social and affordable housing, um, do I take it that that means the provision of actual housing or dwellings, so building? Uh, well, Yes, it does mean the provision of social and affordable housing and under the strategy, um, whilst all governments work together under the strategy, the primary responsibility for um, delivery of public and social and community housing lies with the states and territories. So this is an, um, an indication that the Commonwealth's about to say, right, we're in the business of building affordable and social housing. That's something that is delivered on the ground by states and territories, is that right? That's correct, and that, and they and that's what they uh, agreed was their responsibility under the Australian Disability Strategy. All right, so I might come to the strategy and also another document. I want to start though to ask whether and Mr. Flavell jump in if you feel you wish to answer any of these questions. But uh, can I start with the earlier strategy, the National Disability Strategy that covered the period 2010 to 2020? Are you both familiar with that? I haven't read it, but I am reasonably familiar with it. 
Well, um, accept this proposition that the uh, national disability strategy covering 2010 to 2020 said this, that the Commonwealth states and territories are working together to develop a national quality framework to achieve better outcomes for people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness, including people with disability, by improving the quality and integration of the services they receive. So that's the commitment from the previous strategy. Yep. And so there was a, an express reference to people who were homeless, but also those at risk of homelessness. Now, in your work within the department, are either of you aware of whether a national quality framework was developed? Uh, I, I am advised by my team that, the, that it was developed, but I haven't read it. And um, in terms of a, a national quality framework, the idea of national quality frameworks is not unique to housing, is that it's no. a tool that's used in policy generally. It is. Um, do you know if there was any evaluation of the national quality framework in relation to addressing homelessness or people at risk of homelessness? Uh, no, I don't know if there was an evaluation, but I know that um, at, you'll see in my statement at paragraph 14, we talk about um, UNSSW, New South Wales, mm -hmm. uh, conducted uh, a review of the implementation of the previous strategy. And um, if there was an evaluation, it would have been part of that, but I don't, I don't know. You're not across the deep. No, I'm not. Okay. So uh, during the life of the previous strategy, so 2010 to 2020, yeah. there was also the development of a national housing and homelessness agreement. So Mr. Flavell, this is in your department, is it not? That's in my responsibility, that's correct. And in terms of the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, this is a, an agreement between the Commonwealth and all states and territories in Australia. Correct. And the purpose of this uh, national agreement is that the Commonwealth and the states recognise they have a mutual interest in improving housing outcomes across the housing spectrum including outcomes for Australians who are homeless or at risk of homelessness and need to work together to achieve those outcomes. So that's the purpose of the agreement. Correct. Yeah. And uh, to the extent uh, this agreement exists, were you involved in any drafting of this agreement? No, as per my statement, I commenced this role in November 2020 and the current National Housing and Homelessness Agreement was signed and took effect from 1 July 2018. Right. And um, neither of you may be able to answer this, but do, do either of you know whether or not the previous national disability strategy had any role to play in the development of this agreement? I don't have that knowledge. Okay. So in terms of the way in which the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement operates, it's currently uh, said to be on foot until the 30th of June, 2023. But are we right in understanding through a statement that the intention is to extend it for a further year? Is that right? That, that's correct. So the Commonwealth Minister for Housing and Homelessness has written to her state colleagues and proposed a one-year extension of the agreement. And obviously that's subject to the agreement of all parties um, before taking effect. And uh, you've set out in your statement how the uh, agreement operates, but can I just ask you a couple of sort of features about it? So at, a, at an overall level, the uh, way in which this agreement operates is that the Commonwealth provides funding. The funding is then delivered to states and territories according to the formula set out in the agreement. Yes. There's an expectation that the states and territories will match that funding in particular areas. Uh, only in respect of homelessness. Um, so they're required to at least spend or match the Commonwealth's um, uh, stated um, target, if you want to call it that, uh, for homelessness services. And uh, one of the requirements in terms of this agreement is to meet particular performance monitoring and reporting obligations. So under the agreement, there's certain uh, obligations placed on the states and territories. So for instance, the requirement for them to publish, to have and publish housing and homelessness strategies. Um, and some other um, requirements in terms of performance reporting. They do that um, 
in a variety of ways, but generally speaking, the main mechanism is by providing an annual statement of assurance uh, that's provided to the Commonwealth as part of the conditionality of the agreement. And what does the Commonwealth do when it receives those statements of assurance? Is there any sort of evaluative process that applies at the Commonwealth level? There's an assessment of that. Um, but obviously, in some cases, it's binary. So, for instance, the requirement to have a homelessness and housing strategy, uh, it's about the existence of one. It's not a commentary about the quality or um, other aspects of the strategies, the individual strategies themselves. And when you talk about the existence of having a policy, the states and territories are each required to have a particular policy? Yes, a strategy. Yep. And that policy has got to be public? Yes, yep. In terms of then the reporting against those policies and uh, complying with the requirements of the agreement, does the Commonwealth publish any reports or any data on an annual basis? Uh, we, I'm just trying to think about whether we publish in a consolidated form, certainly in things like our um, Department of Social Services annual report and the associated documents for the budget, we do do some reporting in relation to the agreement. Okay. And as part of the reporting from the states and territories, is there a requirement to report particular data? There, there is. So, for instance, um, financial data. So they're required to tell the Commonwealth to report to the Commonwealth how much or in what way um, the contribution has been spent. Um, so, while for, to, to give you an example, while there is a requirement to spend. Um, at least $135 million on homelessness services. We know um, that the states use about collectively around $600 million of the Commonwealth contribution for that. And in addition, put in about 600 million of their own resources to bring the total to about 1.2 billion. Um, it, there's data in terms of how the money's spent, but what about data in terms of getting a sense of the prevalence of homelessness or insecure housing? Is that data that uh, has to be collected? So there, there, there are some data that's collected, um, some directly, some indirectly. So that's, it's a requirement under the agreement for the states to provide de-identified data about um, people accessing specialist homelessness services. That data is provided to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. And the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare publishes regular, but also an annual report. Uh, about the use of specialist homelessness services that provides a picture. There's a range of other data that the states uh, and territories provide. And the agreement itself um, has a schedule in relation to data improvement. And there's been a separate strand of work conducted by the Commonwealth and states to actually develop some further indicators. And that, um, is that the data improvement plan for 2019 correct. to 2023? Yes. And that resulted, I think, in a new schedule being added to the agreement um, that outlined some of the additional um, housing related um, indicators or information that's um, being collected. I'd refer to that as a work in progress because some of it um, will, for instance, rely on the most recent um, national census in 2021, for instance. Mm -hmm. So it's it's seen as sort of an ongoing process of improving the um, availability of data in relation to housing and homelessness. Well, just in terms of uh, the reference that you've made to the um, AIHW and also to the um, ABS, in terms, sorry to use all of those shorthands, uh, in terms of census data, you're aware, aren't you, that they use different definitions of homelessness? I'm aware that there, there can be different definitions used. So what's the definition of homelessness that applies in relation to this agreement? I don't think that the definition is outlined anywhere in the agreement. I couldn't see a definition of homelessness in the agreement. Is that a weakness in the agreement if it doesn't have a definition of homelessness? Um, weakness maybe, but I think... Um, it, it does reflect the fact that by being too precise for the definition, there is a risk, I guess, of missing out of the boundaries, depending right. on what the definition that one uses. So while there's no definition, the agreement does set out uh, what are described as national priority homelessness cohorts and uh, a homelessness priority policy reform areas. And can I ask you, are you familiar with the national priority homelessness cohorts? I am under the agreement, yes. And so can I sort of briefly, uh, just for the benefit of people following the hearing, the national priority homelessness cohorts are first, 
women and children affected by family and domestic violence. Secondly, children and young people. Thirdly, Indigenous Australians. It's page 14 of the agreement, if that assists me to prevail behind tab seven. Um, people experiencing repeat homelessness. People exiting institutions and care into homelessness and older people. So yes. they're the priority areas. Yes, that's correct. Right. And there is no priority cohort area that specifically identifies people with disability. You agree with that? No, that's correct. And to the extent, of course, there may be people with disability who would come within the existing cohorts. Uh, there's nothing that uh, puts a flag that people with disability might be a priority homelessness cohort. Do you agree with that? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by flag. Sorry, cancel. Well, um, an express reference or something to identify a connection between homelessness and people living with disability. So you're talking about the priority, mm. the priority groups. Yep. There's, yes, there is no separate flag. Do you accept that's a deficiency in the agreement, not to have specific reference to people with disability in the priority homelessness cohorts? It's hard for me to say deficiency. It obviously reflected the view of the uh, um, then Prime Minister and um, Premiers and State um, and Chief Ministers who signed it. I'm not, uh, as I've said, I wasn't around at the time, so I'm not actually privy to the discussions that happened at that most senior political level about why there was a determination made of particular groups being um, being put in as priority cohorts. Well, there was the national strategy on foot at the time that specifically identified the home the risk of homelessness for people with disability and people with disability who are homeless, but they haven't made their way into this agreement, have they? No, that's correct. Right. Now, in terms of the states and territories, am I right in understanding that under the agreement, the states and territories can also identify additional priority homelessness cohorts? Yes, yeah, so this, under the agreement, the states also sign bilateral agreements with the Commonwealth and that outlines the, the specific funding um, that they get. Um, the states are able to nominate or determine other priority cohorts, that's correct. All right, so can I ask you now about the homelessness priority policy reform areas? Are you familiar with them? Yes. So there's three. Uh, one is to achieve better outcomes for people, and that um, is setting out how the desired outcomes for individuals will be measured. And it may include a focus on priority groups, economic and social participation. So that's one, achieving better outcomes. Secondly, early intervention and prevention, including through mainstream services, setting out actions to be taken through homelessness services and mainstream services. And that may include focus on particular client groups or services. And then thirdly, a commitment to service program and design. And that's said to be evidenced and research-based that shows what evidence and research was being used to design responses to homelessness and how responses and strategies will be evaluated. So uh, you're familiar with those three areas? Yes, yes. And is there any reporting done by the states and territories against those three priority reform areas? Uh, not, th they may choose to do it specifically, but again, under the agreement, they're required to, um, to be addressed in the homelessness strategy. So I keep going back to the point that under the agreement itself, it's the requirement for that to be addressed. It's not the Commonwealth's um, role under the agreement to determine the effectiveness or to make any other commentary about the appropriateness of those um, um, particular, the way that those priority areas have been determined and laid out in the strategies. Uh, notwithstanding the absence of any reference to people with disability in the agreement, is it the Commonwealth's understanding that this agreement should address the rights of people who are homeless who live with disability and or the rights of people who are at risk of homelessness who live with disability? Yes. Um, and has there been any consideration in the decision to extend this agreement for a further year to ensure that people with disability will be identified as a priority area for reform and or a priority cohort? 
Council, I think it's probably better for me to refer to the fact that uh, one of the um, elements of the agreement is the Productivity Commission is conducting a mm -hmm. review um, into the, broadly speaking, the sort of effectiveness and operation of the current National Housing and Homelessness Agreement. Uh, that's been a public process with submissions sought. Um, the report to the Treasurer from the Productivity Commission, coincidentally, is to be delivered today. Um, so we understand. Yes. Um, Unless you can give us any sneak peeks. I have not seen the report and, and it goes directly to the Treasurer today, so I, mm. I, I won't see it. Um, although my understanding is that that will be public, really publicly released in around two weeks' time. And um, that uh, Productivity Commission process explicitly, um, in terms of the terms of reference, was asked to look at, at the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement and its compatibility with Australia's disability strategy and other obligations. Um, and the reason I'm making that point is because I think rather than sort of talking about the extra year, which is really a rollover in an existing agreement, the work of the Productivity Commission, including with that explicit focus on people with disability, in my view, would be a material factor to be taken into account for a future national housing and homelessness, homelessness agreement should, of course, all, uh, the, all governments decide to have a successor agreement. So you've set out that Productivity Commission review in the statement at Commissioners at paragraph 106 to 111. Um, and the Productivity Commission, though, is reviewing the agreement that's silent on disability against a strategy that's no longer in force. Is that right? Sorry, could you repeat that? So the Productivity Commission is reviewing the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement that is silent on disability, but it's required to review it against the strategy that is no longer in force. Uh, my, right? my recollection uh, is that it's actually explicit in the terms of reference, the reference to the current Australia's disability strategy. Um, well, I might ask you to take that on notice because uh, I think in terms of the sequence of events, it appeared that the Productivity Commission was um, examining the earlier strategy or you think it's the current strategy? Um. The, and I'll, I'll ask you this because the former strategy does refer to homelessness and people at risk of homelessness. The current strategy, which I'm about to ask you about, is absolutely silent on homelessness. Um, so, Council, I'm referring to um, the Commonwealth submission to the Productivity yep. Commission review. So that's a publicly available yep. document. And is that speaking to the current strategy? It, it does, not it says the terms of reference for the PC review of the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement includes considering the extent uh, to which the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement is meeting the obligations of governments under Australia's Disability Strategy 2021 to 2031. Okay, so it's picking up the current one. All right. Well, can I ask you about the current strategy? And you've dealt with this, and I think, Ms Mitchell, this is your area. Yes. Uh, you've uh, included a copy of the current strategy. That was launched in December last year. It was. And the strategy also sets out priority areas. And there is a priority area concerning housing, mm -hmm. but it, there is no priority area concerning homelessness, is there? Uh, no. The, this, the new strategy really... Um, as I mentioned before, um, New South Wales Uni uh, had a look at the previous strategy. They then determined um, and worked with um, uh, all the disability sector to determine what would go into this strategy. So this strategy was, the new strategy is very much around implementation compared to the previous strategy. Yeah. So they really focused on um, what we can achieve. And rather than having homelessness as a, a particular individual strategy, I mean, there are many that we could have had. They really, they looked at um, uh, focusing on the perfect protective factors for homelessness. So they really focused on education, justice system, employment. But there is no priority area around homelessness or risk of homelessness in the new strategies there. Not specifically. And to the extent um, that the Productivity Commission 
is reviewing the agreement with respect to the current strategy, they're not speaking to each other, are they? Well, under the, under the strategy, as I mentioned before, um, all, all governments, state and territory and local governments have signed up to the strategy. And, and part of the strategy is the provision of social and community housing, which is, you know, directly related to homelessness and availability of housing. And so, so to that extent, it is absolutely part of the, the Australia's disability strategy with all the states and territories. But it's hard, isn't it, that if there's no express reference as a priority area to homelessness or people at risk of homelessness, then it's um, possible that that area can be overlooked and the focus can shift to the accessibility of housing or, or people exi in existing housing arrangements. That is possible. And you would accept, wouldn't you, uh, that for people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness, those circumstances put them among the most vulnerable members of our community who live with disability. Would you accept that? Absolutely. And do you think that there really is a deficiency in the 2021-2031 strategy with respect to addressing the most vulnerable members of our community with disability? being homeless people or people at risk of homelessness, that they have become invisible, haven't they? I, I go back to what I said just a moment ago, and I, I think that whilst the term homelessness is not specifically written into the uh, strategy, uh, it was absolutely a consideration in the consultation process. And in fact, during the consultation process, there are at least five organisations who represent people who are homeless as part of the consultation process. Was there any discussion with people who were actually living with disability and who were homeless at the time? Were they part of the consultation? I don't know the answer to that question. We certainly consulted over 3,000 people. But, um, and you've set that out in some detail in your statement in terms of the consultation process and take it that we accept that the development of the strategy was informed by that consultation. But do you accept there might have been a risk that the consultation did not get to the least visible people with disability in our community? There's a risk in any consultation process that you that you may miss a cohort. But um, as I in my opening to your original first question, um, this is this was a significant process over two years. Uh, and we did consult over 3,000 people. We had 2,500 survey responses. We had 35 focus groups. We had academic workshops. <coughs> and as part of um, the strategy now, we have um, an advisory committee that is uh, uh, chaired by uh, Ben Gauntlet, who is the, um, Dr. Ben Gauntlet, who is also the Human Rights Commissioner. The, um, Disability reform ministers uh, meet monthly to discuss uh, all the issues as part of the strategy. And, and as I just mentioned before, there were five organisations uh, that I'm aware of that were part of the consultation process who, who specifically represent people who are homeless. There was also a parliamentary committee looking at or doing an inquiry into homelessness around the same time as the uh, disability strategy was being finalised. And uh, the, what we've seen the outcome of that inquiry was to identify real risks for people with disability in terms of the homelessness system. Yep. So you can't say that this question of homeless people with disability or people at risk of becoming homeless with disability were not, it could not have been on the Commonwealth's radar in the development of the strategy. I wasn't there as part of the development of the strategy, so. Ms. Mitchell, um, I think you said uh, that uh, one reason why homelessness was not specifically mentioned in the strategy was because the focus was on protective strategies. Why would that be a reason for not specifically referring to homelessness? Uh, I think, um, Commissioner, there would have been 
um, a few areas that we wouldn't have referred to uh, in the strategy. Uh, I wasn't there as part of the development of the strategy, but I, I, I'm, I'm advised. I've understood that. Yeah. I'm advised that um, the protective factors towards homelessness uh, was the focus because they, I mean, all indicators are if you are able to be employed, then you know your chances of homelessness are lessened. If you're developing if protective strategies to improve the outcome in a particular area, you might expect a particular area for which improvements were expected to be expressly identified and the relationship between the strategies and the outcome to be explained, wouldn't it? So we, were, we weren't looking at protective strategies so, uh, per se. We were looking at the protective factors required to support people from entering into homelessness. Um, Ms Eastman has asked you about the consultative process, which you've explained and seems to have involved a very large number of people and organisations. Why do you think it didn't manage to produce uh, suggestions that homelessness should have been specifically included and indeed expressly made a priority area? Why do you think that happened? Um, as I understand the Commissioner... I know you weren't there. No, no. <laughs> I promise not to say it again. Uh, as I understand it, uh, the focus for those uh, who were consulted across the two year period was around affordable and accessible mm. housing. And so that is where uh, the discussions went. I don't know mm. what the discussions focused on for homelessness. Do you think it might suggest that uh, the people with disability are actually quite a diverse group? They're not a uniform group. And if you're going to consult with people with disability, you need, I'm not talking about you personally, but the process needs to ensure that all relevant sections of the disability community are actually contacted and able to make a contribution to the process. In other words, there does seem to be an assumption quite often that if you consult with disability groups, then everybody's covered, but that may not, in fact, tell you very much about the needs of particular groups within the disability community. That's correct, Commissioner, and I would, I would add to that and say that uh, it's such a diverse group across the disability sector that many of the different areas of the sector don't agree with each other, so. Which is an even bigger reason for ensuring that you contact all of them. So uh, in, the, in the development of the strategy, you know, uh, we looked at uh, people with intellectual disability, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mm -hmm. people with disability, uh, women with disability, and as I say, there were uh, several organisations who had specific focus on homelessness. Yeah. So one final thing, just on on the strategy, there's also the outcomes um, approach, and the outcome areas for inclusive homes and communities address the two priority areas being housing affordability, stress, and housing accessibility. And in terms of those outcomes, are these going to be the sort of measures that the Commonwealth will take in relation to examining how the strategy uh, will work? A copy of this commission is a bit tricky, but it's behind tab six and uh, it's page two and it's a fold out sheet. Thank you. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but just to get a sense of where the outcomes framework fits in to the way in which the strategy over the 10 year period is going to be measured. So your question was, are these the key indicators that we will be measuring? Yeah. Uh, yes, that's correct. Right. But you will notice that um, some of them are baseline measures. So if you have a look in the uncolored section, that is about measuring um, the number of people with disability who have reported unmet need. And then if we go to, um, oh, sorry, I might be on the wrong page. Did you say page six? Uh, page two. Oh, so it's got oh, the heading yes. outcome area, inclusive homes and um, communities. So, so same. So if you look at um, housing accessibility, the number of social housing dwellings that meet livable housing design, silver accessibility standards. Mm -hmm. So that will be a baseline measurement mm -hmm. uh, across all the states and territories. And then um, for future measurement will be the number of homes 
uh, that are built to standards according to the National Construction Code and the Livable Housing Design. So that is a future measurement. Mm. Okay, just I might do, because I'm conscious of the time, and I might just ask you now, and this might be Mr. Flavella, a question for you. In terms of the National Construction Code, that, um, yeah. probably spend hours on this, but that's really a code designed to get a, a national approach to the way in which dwellings are constructed and it's looking at achieving accessibility and meeting, as you've just said, Ms. Mitchell, things such as the livable housing design. Livable housing design's got three levels to it, silver, I think, gold and platinum. Yes. So silver's the lowest level, like that's the basic level. Yep. Platinum's the, you know, really- So in the silver level, level, it's uh, the minimum requirement is one accessible shower, uh, uh, accessible entry, um, strengthening of walls, that sort of yeah. thing. So these are these are all measures where there is an existing dwelling and how somebody might have access within the dwelling. But when you look at these inclusive homes and community measures, none of these measures pick up getting people in to housing and the situation of people's pathways into homelessness and the pathways out of homelessness. Do you agree with that? I do agree. Thank you. All right, now you've said in the statement, I think at paragraph 63, that um, coming out of the recent election, there's a proposed national housing and homelessness plan that will be developed. That's correct. All right. I'm not sure um, whether uh, other than referring to the fact of it being an election commitment and an intention to do so, what can you tell us about when uh, a national housing and homelessness plan might be developed? Uh, probably not much because as an election committee, like a lot of election commitments will be ratified in the upcoming October budget, mm -hmm. um, regardless of whether they involve dollars or not. So I think after October or later in the year, there'll be more substantive statements about the process. Um, but I think there's enough in the election commitment for people to get a sense that it will be a, uh, a quite... Um, I don't want to say lengthy, but a, a, an ongoing process of collaboration with um, state governments and a range of other stakeholders with interest in developing that plan. Is there any guarantee that um, people with disability, in particular people with disability or homeless or at risk of homelessness, will be uh, included in that plan? I, I would be staggered if they were not included. Right. The other proposal is the establishment of a National Housing Supply and Affordability Council. Is that something in your remit? The same, yeah. So there's a, effectively a range of commitments the incoming government has made in relation to a housing uh, agenda. And uh, to the extent that the council does not presently exist, are we to understand that the purpose of the council will be comprised of experts from a diverse uh, range of fields that could include finance, economics, urban development, residential construction, urban planning and social housing sectors? Yes. Um, no express reference to disability in the list of experts? No, but I'd observed that um, in sort of past incarnations of these sorts of things, you can have an expert panel that actually has a whole lot of advisory groups that might provide input into it. And again, uh, I think it highly plausible that um, people with disability would, would be represented as part of a, such an advisory group. Um, and would you accept that it is important for people with disability to be represented in something as significant as a housing supply and affordability council? Certainly their views um, uh, and the issues should absolutely be front of mind for the work of, um, of a council such as that. And the Royal Commission's recently held a hearing in Alice Springs where issues of housing and overcrowding in housing and the unsuitability of dwellings in remote and very remote communities, certainly an issue for First Nations people with disability. Would it be expected that there would be representation from First Nations communities on a council of this kind? Uh, again, I refer to what I've said earlier, which is you can think of this as the council, um, which might have a broad remit in thinking about issues like um, overarching government policies to increase the supply of housing generally, that may well then have a series of advisory groups. And I would certainly think that as part of that broader governance structure, um, uh, the particular issues around First Nations people with disability would, would um, feature in that. 
And coming back to some of the earlier questions I asked you about the CRPD and paragraph 114, where you outlined the progressively realising obligations of the CRPD, would you agree with me that a National Housing Supply and Affordability Council would be uh, an appropriate forum to take a rights-based approach to housing and homelessness? And that would be a place where the Commonwealth's commitments to the CRPD could also factor in? Yes, yes. Right. Noting, of course, the council does not yet exist and more detail about its specific functions and um, other associated matters, matters are still matters that the government, the Commonwealth government will need to consider. Uh, would the Commonwealth be prepared to provide information to the Royal Commission as both the National Housing and Homelessness Plan develops and also any development of the National Housing Supply and Affordability Council is developed, subject obviously to the restrictions on cabinet in confidence. But um, is that something that the Royal Commission could receive updates from the Commonwealth on? Yes, we'd be happy to provide updates. And, and the other element which is referred to in our statement is of course the establishment of the um, $10 billion um, National uh, Housing and um, Homelessness Fund. Um, which, uh, as per the election commitment, also has commitments around um, the livability standards that you referred to earlier. Right. One, um, coming back to the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement. So, Mr Favell, in the statement, uh, it's right, isn't it, that the Commonwealth Government provides $1.6 billion each year to the states and territories? That's correct. And this is to... Uh, deal with the access to secure and affordable housing across the housing spectrum? It's to, yes, to make a contribution towards that outcome. And um, in that, um, the funding, there's also specific funding earmarked for the provision of homelessness services. Correct. And I think previous budget, 129 million, but um, your statement indicates that for the 2022 2023 period, it's 135 million. That's correct. Generally, these uh, amounts are indexed year to year. So. And is that looking at homelessness generally? Uh, does it, it, does it um, attach to the particular priority cohorts in any way? Uh, not specifically, no. And uh, to the extent we look at the information you provided in the statement, are we right to understand that from the Commonwealth, there is no specific funding earmarked for people who are homeless or at risk of homeless who live with disability? Uh, not, not that cohort, no. In terms no, of- their... Sorry, sorry. Um, nor are any other priority cohorts. Mm -hmm. So of that $135 million you ref, um, referred to, there's no specific allocation for any of the priority cohorts identified in the, um, in the agreement. And Excuse me, can, you said other priority cohorts. Isn't it a fact that people with disability are not a priority cohort in the Commonwealth State Funding Agreement? It doesn't mention them at all. Yes, yeah, sorry, I misspoke. I should have said the priority cohorts in the agreement. So uh, there's no additional funding either through the agreement or elsewhere, is there, for um, earmarked homelessness funding for people with disability or who are homeless or at risk of homelessness? No, not through the agreement. And are we to understand reading the statement that to the extent that we are to see where the Commonwealth commits any funding and assistance for people with disability experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness, we pick up some of the other measures set out in the statement, is that right? Uh, yes. So they would be things like the Commonwealth Rent Assistance Scheme. And I think you say in the statement that's cost the uh, government 15, sorry, $5 billion annually. That's correct, yeah. And that's the largest budget expenditure in the Commonwealth budget, is that right? Uh, it's the largest um, Commonwealth, housing or Commonwealth, yeah, own... Um, program, if you want to call it that, in relation to housing generally. On housing. Yeah. Okay. And um, in terms of Commonwealth rent assistance, would you agree with me that if you are homeless, that's probably not going to give you much assistance, is it? No, it's, it's oh, I mean, by definition, it is for people in rental uh, accommodation. So people who are homeless are not being directly assisted through that mechanism. 
And it's not a mechanism to uh, assist to get into private rental accommodation. Is it? No, it's more about the affordability of that accommodation. So by making it more affordability, improving um, um, the pathways for a range of people to be to be in secure um, and affordable housing outcomes. Right. And Ms. Mitchell, one of the other um, programs or policies identified in the statement is specialist disability accommodation. That's your area, isn't it? Uh, yes, yes. And so you've said the Australian government is committed to working collaboratively with the state and territory governments to improve the provision of accessible and well-designed housing for people with disability. Yes. Is that right? Uh, we right to understand this isn't the Commonwealth saying we're about to get in the business of building social or accessible housing. Is it back to what I asked you earlier? That's or, correct. The Commonwealth has a commitment, but the delivery rests with the states and territories. Is that right? Except for um, specialist disability um, housing, which falls under the NDI. Yes. So, but even under the NDIS, the Commonwealth's not in the business of building how NDIS housings per se, is it? Uh, they work with, uh, they, uh, it would be best question asked to the NDIS later on this afternoon, but certainly they do um, develop dwellings for people uh, with significant disabilities. And so to be eligible for an SCA accommodation place, um, uh, you have to have extreme functional impairment or high functional support needs. So, um, I, as I understand it, there is a mechanism for houses to be built uh, by um, investors and um, they're built specifically for those clients. Right. So just looking at your paragraph 45, so you say in relation to specialist disability accommodation, there's currently 17,693 active NDIS participants receiving around uh, $248 million in SDA funding. And then you've got some other um, numbers in relation to participants who have funding in their plans for home modifications. Can I ask you this, on for NDIS participants who require modification to their homes, is it the Commonwealth's understanding that it is the Commonwealth's responsibility to pay for, or meet the costs, I should say, meet the costs of modifications to a person's home? Uh, if they are eligible under the NDIS. Is there any role for the states and territories in relation to meeting the costs of home modification for people with disability who uh, receive specialist disability accommodation? I don't know the clear answer to that. So, um, Councillor, if I could be helpful, I mean, it's worth remembering, of course, that the NDIS is a collective scheme involving the Commonwealth and mm -hmm. the states. So to the, to the extent that the states are providing funding to the NDIS, which they do, one can think of that as a, you know, a joint contribution with the Commonwealth towards the cost of those modifications. Right. Again, at paragraph 48, refer again to um, election platform and commitments and there were two specific commitments. One's to investigate solutions to excessive red tape and the mounting queue stopping people with disability accessing appropriate housing. And secondly, the investigation of a $500 million um, specialist disability accommodation underspend to ensure that people with disability can access appropriate housing. What can you tell us about the steps taken uh, so far in relation to addressing both those issues? So the so these were election commitments. So uh, in so much as um, we're working with our state and territory colleagues around the reduction of excessive red red tape, we do that across the board. In relation to investigating the five hundred million SDA underspend, that it was an election commitment, not an actual um, statement, and the five hundred million dollars um, is actually the shortfall gap between what the Productivity Commission forecast for demand at full scheme versus current payments. Right. And what would be the nature of that investigation? 
Is it going to be something done internally or is that um, an area likely to be undertaken by uh, an independent review? Uh, that will be uh, done internally to the Commonwealth Government. The next question I want to ask you, and then um, I might hand over to the commissioners. Uh, there is a reference to Housing Australia Future Fund. This is paragraph 65 to 66. This is a commitment of establishing a $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund. And um, you'll see in paragraph 66 that you refer to all new housing will be constructed in accordance with the principles of universal design to enable access to people with disability. So is this still in the phase of an election commitment or has there yes. been concrete progress on this? No, no. So I think that was one of the things I referred to earlier. I'm not sure I got the name right, but it is the Australia, the, House, the Housing Australia Future Fund. So it, it um, like those other election commitments you mentioned in relation to the council and the plan, is still in the early stages of development. But the reference there at 66 is taken straight out of the election commitment made by the now government. What do the principles of universal design mean against the, the context of the National Construction Code? Uh, my understanding, and I, I, I um, may want to check this, is that it's in relation to meeting at least the silver standard um, that you referred to earlier. Would, would we be right in understanding that if uh, the Commonwealth is to commit $10 billion to a housing fund, that the aim is that into the future, Australia will have accessible housing for anyone who needs housing if they live with disability. Would that be the objective of the fund? Well, the objective of the fund is to increase the overall supply of social and affordable housing. But one of the uh, keys is to ensure that it's accessible housing. Royal Commission's heard that for many people, uh, an offer of a house might sound good, but if it's not going to be accessible, then it might leave them still with those pathways into homelessness and a barrier out of homelessness. Yeah. Do you agree so, with that? Yes, so the commitment as stated at, at Para 66 is that all new housing financed by that fund, in other words, which will be 30,000 new dwellings will be constructed um, in, in um, accordance with those universal design principles. My final question for both of you is, do you accept that the housing uh, policy is not connecting with a disability policy at the Commonwealth level at the present time? I well, given that uh, Mr. Flavell and I are in the same department and we have, uh, I'm uh, driving the changes in the Australian Disability Strategy and we, uh, we take account of each other's policies in development of new policies. So um, historically, I think going, so historically, perhaps not. Mm -hmm. I think going forward, absolutely, uh, that they will be connected. And in fact, uh, even if you look at the closing the gap uh, sector strengthening plan, for example, it has uh, it has disability and housing as two, as two of the four key priority areas. What needs to be done at the Commonwealth level to ensure that for uh, meeting the rights of people with disability, that they're not going to slip between the gaps where you've got uh, systems and policies that might be addressed by a range of different departments? Now, Ms Mitchell, how do you hold that all together? to ensure that there's that disability perspective on all policies that might touch on the interests of people with disability. So one of the um, outcomes and areas in Australia's disability strategy is that all new policy development must take account of the outcomes and um, uh, uh, priority areas for uh, people with disability. And so in so much as if the Attorney General is developing a new policy or the Department of Environment's in, uh, developing new policy, they must account for uh, the outcomes under the Australia's disability policy. It is a Commonwealth policy. Uh, every Commonwealth entity uh, is required to adhere to the policy. And as I've said a couple of times, states and territories and local government also have signed up. Right, thank you for your statement. I didn't get the chance to ask you some questions about emergency responses and 
the easy system, but um, the commissioners might have some questions on those issues too. Thank you, Chair. I shall ask uh, Commissioner Galbally first, but if she has any questions she would like to put to you. Um, thank you, no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. Um, um, just one or two. Um, I'm just referring to the National Housing and Homeless Agreement. Do you think it would be appropriate for that agreement to reference Article 19 and 28 of the CRPD and Article 11 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? In other words, those things which the Commonwealth is meant to provide in terms of housing rights that are referenced by UN declarations, do you think it's appropriate to have that articulated as one of the objectives or the outcomes of the housing agreement in the future? That could certainly be you know, in the future agreement. And um, we kind of answered this before, but um, do you also think that uh, given that people with disability are not, um, are not listed as a priority housing cohort among the priority, that appears to be a significant deficit in the housing agreement that people with disability are not even referenced as a priority housing cohort. I know there is provision for states to add others, but nevertheless, it seems to be a, a glaring um, omission not to have people with disabilities listed among women and children with dementia, given that I think if most, most um, uh, surveys show that nearly a third of the people who occupy social housing, for example, are people with disabilities. It seems to be a glaring omission that they shouldn't be listed as a priority housing cohort. Do you agree? Uh, yes, Commissioner. As I said, I wasn't in the role at the time. This, the, this current agreement was um, developed through the course of 2016, 17, early 18. So um, not had the benefit of talking to the key decision makers. Um, noting obviously it was signed off by um, the then PM and, and premiers and chief ministers about what was the decision matrix for deciding on priority cohorts for inclusion in the current agreement. Um, I understand that the, um, the national construction um, was it, uh, code was subject to a regulatory impact statement, which has been referenced by other witnesses. Is that something that was procured by the Commonwealth and could you provide the Royal Commission with the uh, the text of the regulatory impact statement? Uh, I'm not aware of the regulatory impact statement for the National Construction well, Code, but I will- Regulatory impact analysis. Analysis, I will, I have, I will have to take that one on notice. Great. Sure. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we will hear evidence uh, later today, I think, <clears throat> that uh, from Ms. Short, that during the financial year ended 30 June 2022, around about 1,600 participants in the NDIS reported that they had been homeless during that year. And a total of uh, about 6,200 NDIS participants had either been homeless or were at risk of homelessness in accordance with the definitions or criteria that were used uh, by the NDIS through one or other of its agencies. Given those that uh, evidence and those facts in the basis of your experience, what can be done to address that? What would you see as the way to approach that? Is it to just take uh, the national disability strategy and use the processes that have been provided there, or is there something more specific that can be done within the framework of the NDIS to address a problem of apparent homelessness among NDIS participants of all people? So, Commissioner, the NDIS were, had to do individual plans with uh, all of those People, I, so. I understand how it works. My, my question is, what can we do about it? Well, I think evidence was given yesterday that you can't cure homelessness without housing availability. And <laughs> that's it. Well, as, I, as I've, I've stated uh, before... Are we in a sloth of despond, though? Commissioner, as I, as I stated before, uh, 
accessible and affordable housing is uh, key to the Australian Disability Strategy and um, the responsibility for the provision of social and community housing remains uh, the responsibility of the states and territories. And, and we're working with them. And as Mr. Flavel has said, we, we provide considerable money from the Commonwealth to uh, support those processes in the states and territories. But these are NDIS participants. Well, so as the question might be better placed to the uh, NDIS about the processes that they use, but if a person is at risk of becoming homeless and they're an NDIS participant, then the NDIS work with them very closely and they provide interim accommodation. There is any number of actions that they take to to stop someone falling into homelessness. All right. Mr. Flabel, can you uh, give us uh, any more reason for optimism that we can extract ourselves from the sloth of despond? Your words, Chair. I, I, think, I think I would agree with Ms. Mitchell that it's really, your question was about specifically about NDIS. But oh, yes, I think yeah. that is very much in the domain of the NDIA because these are people who have a plan. Uh, and are in sort of full purview, if you want to call it that, of the agency. Uh, that's different than I think people outside the NDIS who may um, be homeless or have particular challenges around uh, accessing suitable accommodation. Yes. And to take up uh, Commissioner Ryan's question and question <coughs> uh, and what, uh, so, what, fo what follows from that? I'm not sure I follow your question. Sorry, you have to. Well, you, you, you made a statement, uh, and I just want to know what, what follows in terms of policies that might, uh, might apply. Yes, I understand that it's the NDIA, but I'm looking to see what might be suggested for the Commonwealth's role in dealing with this, given that uh, these are NDIS participants. The NDIS, I understand that the states have a financial role to play, but it is essentially a Commonwealth scheme. What can we do about this? Yeah, I, sorry, I, in relation to those NDIS participants, you know, I think it is very much in the purview of the NDIA um, and, and the solutions are really for them because I think as has been identified, one has to look at um, the pathways and how people who have a plan are finding themselves in a situation of homelessness. I think that is a, you know, a, a significant concern. Yes, but I rather thought that there might be something to be said for the, a national disability strategy addressing this issue, not just the say it's the NDIA's problem. But anyway, you say uh, it's the NDIA that needs to. Commissioner, be. the NDIS is actually a joint uh, system between the Commonwealth and the States. Yes, I understand that, but it's a Commonwealth Act that sets out the framework, and uh, it's uh, it's it's a, a Commonwealth responsibility in the sense that uh, it's the Commonwealth has enacted legislation in order to implement it after a process of consultation and cooperation with the states and the states providing financial assistance of one kind or another. And the states agreeing to key elements of the scheme as well. Mm. The legislative framework, as you know, also includes, you know, particular responsibilities that the states to agree. That yes, I, I understand that there's the... Uh, What's that expression that I keep forgetting? Optas, Coptas, whatever it is. Aptos. Yes, Aptos, whatever. Yes, all right. Okay, thank you. What do we do now, Ms. Eastman? Uh, well, that concludes the evidence. So thank you, Mr. Favell and Ms. Mitchell. Uh, I deferred playing uh, some evidence that we pre recorded with William uh, yesterday. So we'll play that. And then immediately after that, we'll adjourn for morning okay. tea for about 15 minutes. All right, thank you again, uh, Ms. Mitchell and Mr. Lavelle, for coming to the Commission and giving us evidence and providing us uh, with uh, assistance on the important policy issues that we confront. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. So, William, can I start by asking you a little bit about your story? Yes. What, what about your life yep. and how you've come to be part of the community here at Newtown? What would Newtown. you like to tell us about yes. your life? Um, this uh, Newtown Neighbourhood Centre has, um, has a lot of um, diverse um, service providers mm. that help out, uh, including providing a bit of food as well to people who are um, li living in the sort of um, the 
be, let's say, the people who, who have less money as well as who are a bit of a struggle mm -hmm. to, to live in um, Sydney, Australia. Have you had a bit of a struggle? Yeah, you can say Sydney? I had a bit of a struggle because previously I was, before living in social housing, I was living in the boarding house. Mm -hmm. So this boarding house was around the, the, the inner west. So it's quite close to Newtown, but I didn't know of this service that existed in Newtown. Mm. How did you come to be living at the boarding house? The boarding house was a place that um, there was not really much rental properties, as well as yeah, I had trouble um, basically to find suitable accommodation and affordable accommodation in Sydney as well as you want to be living independent um, to look after yourself independently no, try not to live with friends too much mm. but they can help out mm. so with that when you were living in the boarding house how long did you live in the boarding house boarding house I first lived in the boarding house for a few years mm. More, more than two years in the, in the same boarding house. I was in Leichhardt. Mm. The first boarding house was introduced by me by a friend who lived in the inner west yep. of Sydney. And it was a boarding house that um, existed previously. It wasn't renovated quite recently um, at that time. And uh, when you were living at the boarding house, did you have a job? What were you no, doing? I wasn't. Um, working um, full time in, in full time capacity but sometimes I had some jobs which were contract jobs like in information technology IT that involved project work and that involved um, uh, let's say putting out laptops uh, bagging laptops as well as loading software onto the laptops and before you were living in the boarding house, what were your circumstances before in the you found in the, the boarding house? In the circumstances before finding that boarding house, because it was a bit difficult to, to um, afford a place as well as finding um, income to support myself. Mm -hmm. And that was a really challenging bits of life that um, you felt that you, you couldn't you had to give up a lot of stuff and you had to give up the place that you want to live and um, there was some times that um, you, you had nobody to go to and no, no place to go to. Yeah. Mm. So you can say that um, during the, when I lived in the boarding house and um, when I moved to, to another boarding house uh, in the inner west, obviously I was involved in um, or attended appointments, appointments mm. with a, a Disability Employment Services desk. Yes. yes, yes, yes. So that was at that phase in life that you attended appointments that you felt that um, they could help you find a job and you could um, basically be helped out in a humane way, not, not in an um, uh, intimidating way or a wrongful way. But sometimes... Um, you felt there was a bit of change in, in, in what they do in the sort of helping out. That the there's providers were changing um, their location, people were moving about, and you felt you couldn't cope basically. So that when the DES, um, when you're working with the DES providers, they DES would provider. have just been looking at your employment options, not the, the rest of your life? They sort of, yeah, what, what, what they, did were they sort do? of, um, they, they were on, on the what target driven sort mm. of they they wanted you in, in into a a sort of a charity based job a door to door charity mm. based job they, there wasn't that much support around it you were going out by yourself you didn't really talk to the the employers that much mm. over over the phone but not face to face mm. Mm. and um the desk provider just pushing that job over and over again Was Any, it a job you wanted to do no 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 at that time, so what if you were looking for a job with the desk provider? What yeah. supports did you need to what find the right job for what you? Science, uh, yeah, did you need what support? Anything? Not really, but obviously it has to be sometimes in the interest of what you're doing, yeah. like in IT. Yeah. Like if it was a charity work, it was out of 
the scope out of the interest of what you've done previously. Yeah. Can I ask you about sort of attitudes towards people with disability? Attitudes. Have you thought about that? Um, maybe it's. He didn't have to, let's say in the second boarding house, mm. they didn't really know you if you were disabled. Mm. They, they were just um, sort of more intimidating way. Mm. It felt that you were a bit targeted mm. in terms of, so there were slipping notes under your door in, in the second boarding house. But in the first boarding house, they, they weren't doing that mm. too much. Mm. And um, in terms of attitudes, I think there was any definition of what, what an attitude is mm. to a dis disabled person or a person who, who was seeing a counsellor or mm. something like that. Mm. They, 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 there's, no, they, there's no sort of... If, if there was a job provider that, say, you have to be on DES, mm. you, you said, you're fine, you're fine, but mm. they still want to be... A, they still want to force you into DES because there's... There's that sort of, sort of, sort of a forced, like a forced hand onto you. Mm. They they want to keep you in, in that des des provider or something like that. They 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 know you still. They they write things about you. You have a health plan. That they can write things about you about a health plan, mm. but it's it's sort of sort of half there's a half truth to it that you want to escape but you can't something mm. like that yeah. so you don't have a DES provider at the no I don't have a DES yeah. I, I, I've, I've escaped that DES back onto the normal mainstream providers oh okay yeah. so yeah. back to the mainstream but, providers but, but, yeah. have you got any thoughts or ideas that you'd like to tell the Royal Commissioners about what might make the lives of people with disability particularly where they live and the type of housing available to them what would make things of a long hard journey you can say you had to go through a, a lot of processes mm. that you have to go through you have to, to get your doctor to fill out some information in regards to your application to social housing um, maybe what would have made it easier for easier. you? Um, maybe if there was some more jobs available for disabled people, maybe. But even that, I can say, there wasn't that much affordable housing. Um, or there's a limited amount of stock of, of affordable housing as well as paying that much for affordable housing that you had to go into social housing. Now, is there anything else that um, you wanted to talk about today that I haven't asked you about mm. that you wanted to discuss? Yeah, so yep. during the, the time in the second boarding house, the second boarding house had a, um, a caretaker. Mm. The, the caretaker took the rent as well as introducing the property, uh, go go inside the property uh, with you to mm. introduce the room, to uh, to as well as to to look after the the entire boarding house, mm. something like that. So the person actually knocked on the door a few times. Mm as well as slipping notes under the door, as well as sort of in intimidating that we were complaining about what you had inside the room. If the room smelt a bit, that was natural because it hasn't been rented out for a time being. And they said, yeah, you have to clear this smell out. Mm. The, it, and the smell was something that it could be done only if there was somebody living inside. Mm. So it's sort of intimidating as well as being half abusive in terms of how we were treating the, the people who lived. Um, maybe could, it was targeted towards me. Maybe yeah. some what, of, Could you do anything about that? Like, you know, who do you go to talk to about that? No, I couldn't talk to her. You have to find out what's causing the problem. Eventually, that you had to move out, basically. You had to move out because you just couldn't take the sort of the way that the caretaker was treating you as well as not treating other people fairly or unfairly that's the thing sort of you felt that you were unfairly targeted basically 
and is it um, it's better now, isn't it? Yeah, it's much better changed. now yeah. with the housing and with the the room size as well as the, the you have your own facilities, yeah, yeah. yeah, laundry and whatever facilities, but by yourself, you don't have to share the place, mm. and you're not you're not intimidated by that caretaker, mm. basically. Commissioner, that's William who we met um, along the way and he wanted to share his story with you. So thank you for the opportunity to share that and to listen to that. Could we adjourn maybe for 15 minutes? Yes, well, it's now 11.25. Shall we adjourn until 11.45? That's fine. Yeah, right. Thank you. We'll the Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. <coughs> yes, Ms. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. So uh, welcome, Ms. Zoe Dendal. And Zoe Dendal is the Acting Executive Director of Housing Homelessness New Disability New South Wales as part of the New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice. There's a copy of her statement in the hearing bundle, which is part two volume one behind tab 16. And I think we've first got to do oaths or affirmations, is that right? Yes, thank you very much, Ms. Dendal, for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence. Thank you for your statement, which we have, and uh, we have uh, read all 46 pages of it. Um, just so you know where everybody is, Commissioner Galbally is on screen. She is joining the hearing from Melbourne. Commissioner Ryan is on my left and uh, I'm the chair of the Royal Commission and if you'd be good enough to follow the instructions of my associate who is over there, he will administer the affirmation to you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. I'll now ask Ms Eastman to ask you some questions. Uh, Ms. Dendal, you've provided a statement to the Royal Commission dated the 5th of August this year. Uh, I might need you to do a bit more than just nod your head so we can hear you. I have. And um, there's been some corrections that you wanted to make to the statement. There has, thank you. And you provided us a, a, a supplementary document setting out those corrections. We have. And there was one further correction, I think, to paragraph 29, right, that came in, sorry, 26, that um, was brought to the Royal Commission's attention on Monday. So can I just deal with that correction? So, Commissioners, it's page 6, paragraph 26. It's the second line and it's the figure. So we delete 16,281 and replace that with 11,022, right? Okay. So together with that correction and the corrections that you uh, provided to us on the 25th of August, are the contents of the statement true and correct? They are, thank you. Can I just indicate that paragraph 20 uh, should also be amended in the same way as 26, right. which it also states the 16,281, which should be 11,022. Oh, thank you, Ms. Vanessa. I only had the reference to paragraph 26. All right. So with those, with just that, that correction to the numbers, the contents are true and correct. Correct. All right. Now, uh, it's a case, isn't it, that this statement was prepared with some assistance across the department and from other officers. Is that right? That is correct. The statement's reflective of both the department and other New South Wales agencies. And even though this is your statement, some of the content in terms of the technical um, aspects and the operational aspects are not part of the areas that you have direct responsibility for. Is that right? That is correct. And uh, the Crown Solicitor offered to 
uh, provide two additional people to give evidence with you as part of a panel, is that right? That is right. And you will tell me if there are areas in your statement where you don't feel equipped to answer or it's not within your particular area of expertise or experience, is that right? I will. Okay, thank you. All right, so I want to start with the statement. You are the Acting Executive Director in the area of Housing, Homelessness and Disability, and this is a position that you've held since the 27th of September 2021. And just to understand a little bit about your role and responsibilities, your current role requires you to lead the commissioning of housing, homelessness, disability, and other related services, including policy settings, working with the Commonwealth and other state and territories, program design and implementation of system stewardship. That's correct. Um, can you uh, tell me, does that mean that you work to the national agreement? Uh, we do work to the overarching National Housing and Homelessness Agreement. And uh, were you present when Ms Mitchell and Mr Flavell gave their evidence earlier today? I was. Okay. Right. Now, um, the, I want you to look at paragraph eight of your statement. And as I understand it, this takes it from your particular functions into what the department's main focus is, working with the community and non-government partners and other agencies. And so you've identified there a number of different cohorts. Can I describe it that way? So you're looking at improving outcomes for vulnerable children and young people, but people with disability is identified as a particular area. In terms of that area, what is the department's main focus in working with community, non-government partners and other agencies to improve outcomes for people with disability? Uh, so there's a there's a range of different aspects across the department uh, that work with people with disability. So with the transition of services to the National Disability Insurance Scheme, uh, the department's no longer a delivery of service. I might just ask you to slow down just so the interpreters can keep um, up with you and also that I can make sure that I don't miss anything you tell me. Thanks. Uh, so the department's no longer a delivery of service for people with disability, the, the transition to the National Disability Insurance Scheme, but we still have interfaces with the Commonwealth and other states and territories from a disability policy setting. Uh, we also work to principles of disability inclusion across all portfolios of the department to ensure that people with a disability are captured across all programs and in disability uh, in the housing operations arms there's also uh, the focus there for people with a disability for when housing operations staff are supporting the clients. The department no longer has any role in what might be described as being a case manager for a particular person with disability is that right? That is correct. All right. Now, uh, again, looking at your statement, you've provided some context before you answer some of the questions that the Royal Commission uh, asked you and the department to address. And under context, you say the New South Wales government's mainstream service delivery agencies are required to make their services accessible and to make reasonable adjustments to services where needed. Now, what's the source of this? Does this come out of a policy? Is it a legislative requirement? What's the source of this statement? Uh, it's, a, it's a guiding principle that we work by in the department. All right. And what um, does it mean to say that the services must be accessible? Uh, so it's uh, linking to the, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, it's where all services uh, for the general population should also be available for, for everybody on an equal basis. Right, and I don't think in your statement there is any reference to the Convention on Persons with Disabilities. So how does that convention and the rights in the convention apply to the work of the New South Wales government mainstream service delivery agencies? Mm -hmm. So all policies that are developed or programs or, or products that are available for people are, are focused for people who are vulnerable and that encompasses people with disability. So the convention, are you familiar with the convention at all? I am. So the convention sets out a range of different rights in different areas. 
you're aware of that? Yes. And some overarching principles. In general things. And um, in terms of looking at the particular sets of rights, does the New South Wales government have a process by which it takes a particular right in the CRPD and uh, applies it in the development of policy or the making of laws? Do you know about that? Uh, I can't comment on, on direct uh, references necessarily to the conventions in, in policies or documents. I'd need to take that on notice for specific reference in documents. But uh, definitely there is the principle of disability inclusion. Uh, so as a government department, we are required to have a disability inclusion action plan. Uh, mm -hmm. So there is that principle that's applied. So if there's a disability inclusion access plan, then that plan has got to, to meet the rights set out in the CRPD? Uh, again, I, I'm not sure if it's a direct reference to the convention itself in, in, in the document rather than the, the general themes and principles that the convention stands for. Okay. And the other one that you've got here is to make reasonable adjustments to services where needed. All right. Now, the statement, the statement does actually have a fair bit on reasonable adjustments. Now, if this is an area you're not familiar with, let me know. But if you can turn to page 18, paragraph 79, you tell us that, re that the responsibility to provide reasonable adjustment arises under the Disability Discrimination Act and applies to all accommodation providers. Um, I just want to be clear, are you saying that um, there that the obligation on reasonable adjustments only applies to accommodation providers? Or does this extend to the New South Wales government as well? Uh, so this reference is specific into the question around uh, housing and community infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So it has been answered in response to accommodation providers in this instance. But when going to your statement on context where you refer to making reasonable adjustments, does that word or the expression reasonable adjustments have the meaning by reference to the Disability Discrimination Act or something else? Uh, not, a, not a direct link, but again, implied principles. Well, just perhaps while we're on this bit, and I know this is a, an area that your colleagues have got the particular expertise on, but I assume that you're familiar with the concept of reasonable adjustments. Right. And, um, and this is an example, isn't it, in terms of home modifications to how reasonable adjustments might work in practice? That's correct. And the purpose of a reasonable adjustment is what in your understanding? Uh, so, so my understanding is that a re reasonable adjustment may come in the form of either a, a minor reasonable adjustment or modification or a major modification. Okay. So it, would a reasonable adjustment be something that, uh, for example, the department or an accommodation provider would have to do if a person with disability required some change or some different way in which the services might need to be provided, is that right? It would. So uh, my understanding is if it was a minor reasonable adjustment, it would be the responsibility of the provider. So in the instance of public housing, that would be the Land and Housing Corporation, or in the instance of community housing, if that asset was owned by a community housing provider, it would be the responsibility of the community housing provider. And in terms of the Land and Housing Corporation and its obligations, I think the statement says that the corporation meets the funding obligation to give effect to reasonable adjustments, not the department, is that right? That, that is my understanding where it's a minor modification. If it's a major reasonable adjustment that's required, that is where the NDIS funding would, would come into okay, effect. I, I want to ask you about the differences between minor and major, but just looking at this, I just want to look at paragraph 80. So it's the corporation's responsibility to do the funding and the department's role is to communicate with the tenants around their tenancy. So if I'm a, a person who is in housing, um, public housing owned by the corporation, and I need to have an adjustment to my housing arrangements, it would be the department who would communicate with me as part of my tenancy about what adjustments I could ask for, is that right? That's correct. So the Land and Housing Corporation 
own the, own the land, the asset, and the department are the tenancy managers. So in terms of sort of understanding how this idea of minor and modification, minor modifications and major modifications work, is it the department's role to give information to the tenants about what is a minor modification and what might be something considered to be uh, more substantial and a major modification? That is my understanding, and that would be through the form of an occupational therapist assessment. And why do people need to have an occupational therapist assessment for either a minor or a major um, modification? Uh, so that is the requirement under the, the, the modifications that there would need to be a, an allied health professional. So in, in this instance, an occupational therapist to assess what modifications would be required. Right, but what's the reason for having an OT report or assessment? I'd have to take that on notice. Very Lisa sure. is an operational right. consideration. The statement sort of very helpfully sets out what might be a more minor modification. So they could be things as, and this is in the table commissioners on page 19, they could be things like adjusting where the letterbox is, relocating the bin area, it could be installing a doorbell or a button, uh, it could be adjustments to the handles, it could be adjustments to kitchen cupboards, and I'm just taking a few examples, relocating PowerPoints, things like that. So these, would you agree, these seem to be sort of small modifications to what's already existing either externally or internally in a dwelling is that right that's my understanding okay. but you've still got to have an ot report to say i think i need the doorbell button to be a little bit lower or higher as i understand it i do believe that there are some circumstances where an occupational therapist report is not required when it's deemed a minor modification Okay, but um, and in terms of uh, an occupational therapist report, does the corporation or the department have an in-house uh, group of occupational therapists who can go and assist tenants with disability to identify what modifications need to be made? Do in, in uh, acknowledgement of the need for, for more occupational therapists to assist with, with social housing applications and home modification applications, the department invested two, $2 million in 21-22 and again this financial year for additional occupational therapists for DCJ housing staff to have access to to assist with the home modification process. That's a relatively recent thing to have the in-house OT. Uh, so in, in terms of the increase, but that is my understanding that that came into effect last financial year in, in recommendation in response to one of the recommendations in the Ombudsman report. All right, so minor modifications, they're the sorts of things that we've just looked at. And um, in terms of meeting that cost, is there any policy about how much would be spent on a minor modification? Do you know that? I'm not aware of that. I'd need to take that on notice. Then there's also a category of major modifications and they're described as highly tailored to individual requirements. And the statement, this is paragraph 86 says, they result in modifications beyond the reasonable adjustments responsibility of a social housing provider. Right, now I want to ask you about that. So in terms of using the Disability Discrimination Act, a reasonable adjustment is any adjustment up to the point it imposes unjustifiable hardship on the person to make the adjustment. You're aware of that? Mm -hmm. And are you aware of what the elements are that go into working out what an unjustifiable hardship is? No, not in detail. But um, accept this proposition that unjustifiable hardship is not just limited to the cost of the adjustment, can be a range of other factors as well. Are you aware of that? Yeah, I would accept okay. that. And in terms of... Um, the minor modifications, and we just look at the examples in the table, you'd agree with me that none of the making of adjustments of that kind would impose an unjustifiable hardship on the state of New South Wales or the um, Land and Housing Corporation, would it? Uh, so the, the provider, so in this instance for public housing, the, the Land and Housing Corporation would be funding these minor yep. modifications. Okay. Now, when it, we talk about major modifications, I'm not quite sure on what basis 
you could say a major modification is beyond reasonable adjustment responsibilities of, of a social housing provider. Are you saying there that the very nature of a major modification would impose unjustifiable hardship on a social housing provider? My, my understanding is that uh, the major modification comes into effect as identified by the NDIA's reasonable and necessary definition. But somebody, like, assume there's somebody who is in um, social housing in New South Wales and they have a disability, but they're not an NDIS provider, uh, uh, NDIS participant. Mm -hmm. And they may need a modification to their house. Say if they've got a mobility disability in terms of perhaps widening the doorways or uh, making adjustments to bathrooms, and they might need to be tailored to that person particularly. Are we right in understanding that the policy approach is that those sorts of adjustments would not be made? Uh, it cost too much? No, that's not correct. So, again, my understanding is that Land and Housing Corporation do assess on a case by cases major modifications where required for non NDIS participants. And, and that would be a New South Wales responsibility? That's my understanding. And is it the view that if the person is an NDIS participant, then the funding for any major modification should be? with the NDIS funding arrangements in that particular person's plan, is that right? That, that is my understanding. I, I will just uh, say though that the, this uh, part of the statement does fall under the remit of Land and Housing Corporation and our housing operations, so that there are some things I'll need to take on notice. I accept the limits on this, um, but I just it's really to use this as an example on how um, you approach reasonable adjustments in services that are needed. Okay. So would you agree with me that this seems to think about adjustments only through the perspective of how much it's going to cost? From the home modifications perspective around accommodation in this instance, yes. And um, has the do you know if the corporation or government generally has put a ceiling on how much will be spent on making adjustments? for people with disability in their dwellings? Not that I'm aware of, I'd need to take that on notice. Right. Now, there's also something that works with the Disability Discrimination Act called the Disability Access to Premises and Building Standards 2010. Are you familiar with that? Not, not really. Not really? Okay, so that might be something your colleagues know about. All right, so when we asked you to provide a statement, uh, we did ask you some questions just to get a sense of the prevalence of people with disability who are homeless or at risk of homelessness in New South Wales. So you, um, um, we've done that by reference to people who might be applicants on the New South Wales Housing Register. So if you want to have a look at your statement, this is back to paragraph 19 on page four. So in terms of the New South Wales Housing Register, just tell me if my understanding is correct that if somebody uh, is seeking accommodation or a dwelling through social housing in New South Wales, they have to make an application? There's, yeah, in New South Wales, there is what's called a housing pathways application process for somebody to put in a housing application to go on the social housing register. Okay, and there's um, a range of criteria that you have to satisfy or eligibility criteria that you have to satisfy. And commissioners, a copy of the eligibility criteria policy is behind tab 19, starting at page three in the um, bundle. I won't take you to that to extend all just given time. Um, but the policy, uh, would the policy be the first place that somebody who might want to apply for housing should go to work out if they're eligible or not? The, the, yes, the housing policy would state the criteria. Okay, and in terms of just assisting us for people with disability, is the fact of having a disability enough to meet the eligibility criteria or does it have to be something more? Uh, so predominantly people with a disability would generally meet the criteria for the priority housing wait list. So to meet the criteria for the priority housing wait list, you meet the criteria for the, for the general wait list. And then there's also an additional four criteria that, that you can meet. 
and in most instances people with a disability uh, do meet the criteria of the existing accommodation is inappropriate for basic requirements that's not to say that they wouldn't fit one of the other criteria often they would fit fit many of, of the four but uh, in most instances they they always fit that criteria for the priority wait list right and then looking at the information that you've provided to the Royal Commission is uh, in terms of the number of applicants on the housing register at the present time, there's almost 50,000 people, is that right? Well, that's for the 2020-21 period. That's correct. And um, we have asked you about how do you collect information that might identify a person living with disability? And you've told us that you do collect that information and about 22% of the people who are currently on the housing register identify as people with disability. Is that right? Yeah, as defined by the disability support that was the next thing. So the thing with that, with that definition is it's not just any type of disability, is it? Is that you define disability for the purpose of, of uh, the register as a person who uh, is on the disability support pension and that's the main source of income to the household head. So uh, would I be right in understanding if you apply that approach to identifying disability, being on the DSP and being the person who's the household head on the DSP, that that's not necessarily going to pick up everybody who may identify as a person with disability for the purpose of the register, is that right? Uh, that's correct. So uh, that picks up what we call the household head. There is also data collected on the number of people who may be in the household with disability, that that number is often quoted as a number or more. And by or more, that means that there may be some people in the household that's not picked up through the disability support pension. So if they're on an aged care pension, if they're a small child, for example. And for the 22% of people who um, you treat as people with disability, are all of those people identified as a priority, as priority applicants? No, they're not. Why not? I'd have to take that on notice. Okay. And um, in terms of then um, some of the um, data that you've provided us in for waiting lists, can I ask you about that? Mm -hmm. Is that the process of the waiting list may depend on, just tell me if I'm right on this, when you apply, so where you are in the queue, but it might also um, apply in a priority setting where you might sort of go up the list and not be waiting in the queue, is that right? Yeah. So it also depends on uh, the availability of supply, location, uh, accessibility, and if it's suitable for the person on the wait list. So you're correct in saying just uh, hypothetically, if you're first on, on the priority wait list doesn't necessarily mean that you will get access to a yep. property first. It is around the suitability for each individual. So you can a person can actually go online and say, I live at Parramatta or I want to live at Parramatta here's my particular circumstances, is that that location of living in Parramatta or that particular local government area, that might have a bearing on the housing stock available in that area. And if that's your preference to live in that area, that might depend on how long you are on the waiting list. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. And so across New South Wales, there's going to be real differences in where people are seeking social housing. Is that right? Correct, there's differences across the state. Okay. So are you able to help us with some of the numbers that are provided in the statement? So this is page nine, paragraph 36. Because we asked you about some waiting times um, and we've heard some people telling us that they've been on the housing uh, list for a long time. And I don't know if you were following the evidence yesterday, but Claudia, who's a young person said, she thought she joined the housing list in 2016, for example, and she's now 25, but she's not sure where she is or what might happen to her. And I'm not asking you to talk about her circumstances. Well, we heard from Charlotte at the beginning of the hearing about dropping off the waiting list. So um, 
assume that that there's there has to be something, doesn't there, that the person remains on the waiting list? Do they have to do something? Uh, not unless their circumstance changes and, and they wish to update the, their circumstance. So they have to identify if there might be some changes in what the accessibility might be if they're an applicant with disability, whether they need steps or they don't need steps or whatever it might be. That's correct. So the uh, suitability assessment is based on the original housing application. And if, if somebody does need to change what that information is, then that would be taken into consideration for, for where. All right. So looking at the tables here, so the median waiting time for newly housed in public housing is reported as two and a half months in 2019-2020 and two and a half months in 2020-2021. That seems to be quite quick, two and a half months. What is it about a person who uh, would uh, have that priority flag on the waiting list that would enable them as I assume this is sort of average across all the locations to be housed within 2.2 months. So again, it would be around the availability of, of the supply in, in that area and also the suitability for, for the applicant. Okay. And uh, you haven't got, I think, any further data to say of the priority list of people with disability, either coming out of homelessness or at risk of homelessness, whether for that, that group, the priority would also be 2.2 months. Uh, I can take that on notice to, okay. to drill down to that data. Right, so, so priority might be that you're in relatively quickly, two and a half months. And I say relatively quickly because table four sets out the maximum waiting time for newly housed public housing. And for the period 20, 19 to 2020, that's 176.3 months. And that's now gone up in 2020 to 2021 as 180.8 months. So my rough calculation is that's about 15 years. And that's a long time. What's the reason why it is so long for somebody who um, has applied for housing? Can I ask you about that? Would these have been people who applied 15 years ago? Or are these people who are applying now? And if you've applied at recent times, your expectation might be that you'll have to wait for 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, it comes uh, down to the availability of, of supply and the suitability. So uh, suitability of, of uh, public uh, social housing, community housing has, has really changed in, in previous years as well. So a lot of um, your older older housing accommodation might look like is more your three to four bedroom homes where people are now maybe looking more for a one to two bedroom, for example. So predominantly on the, on the waiting list, there is more people that are wanting a different type of accommodation than some of the older housing stock enables. So that's one of the factors. And then it also comes down to supply in geography and suitability for the applicant. Right, and we heard yesterday uh, about reasonable offers and Ms Morehouse spoke about her experiences. I'm not asking you to comment on her case specifically, but she talked about the two reasonable offers and you've included in the material for the Royal Commission, commissions, this is behind tab 20, uh, a policy called matching and offering a property to a client policy. Is that something you're familiar with? Uh, that is an operational document. And that says generally a client will receive up to two reasonable offers of housing from their preferred social housing provider. This means that where a client selects public housing and community housing as their preferred provider, they may receive offers from the department and any community housing providers participating. So that's the way, that's where the two offers come from. Is that right? So if a person uh, has two offers and that they have rejected both offers, what happens to them? My understanding is that the, the two offers are made on the original housing application. So it can be that if the person needs to update their, their circumstance and details, that that can, can be done. And I also understand that there is a process where somebody can put in an appeal if they feel that their offer has been rejected on unfair grounds. Right. Well, I, I take it that 
um, this is not a policy that you're responsible for or it is? No, this uh, sits as an operational matter. And uh, when we've looked at the policy, there's sort of nothing in there that speaks to the experience of people with disability and whether or not the, a reason for rejecting an offer might be that it's just not accessible to suit disability. Uh, yeah. On the basis that if it does do that in terms of a reasonable offer on page one and the third dot point speaks Getting to, to that accessibility. So uh, the policy does not, um, let me put it this way, the policy does not provide that for people with disability that the two reasonable office, office, offers are not relevant to people with disability. So people with disability are treated in the group for whom two reasonable offers, offers might be made. If they reject the reasonable offers, as you say, they have appeal processes. But there's nothing specific for people with disability in relation to the number of offers. Uh, again, my understanding is that the offers are made based on the housing application's individual needs. So that would include accessibility. So uh, an offer should only be deemed as reasonable if it took into consideration the accessibility requirements for that individual or household. And one of the, um, again, if you don't know this, tell me, in the policy, there's a range of references to legislation and compliance. And one includes the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Act and the other includes the Disability Discrimination Act. You're aware of that? I'm, I'm not familiar with the policy that you're referring to. Right. So. And this policy it doesn't have um, any provision for making reasonable adjustments or explain how reasonable adjustments under the Disability Discrimination Act works. Are you aware of that? I was not. Thank you. Okay. So now I want to ask you about the New South Wales strategy. It's the New South Wales Homelessness Strategy 2018 to 2023. Is this a policy you're aware of? I am. Okay, so this is in your area. So um, is this homelessness strategy a policy developed to meet the national uh, housing and home national homeless and housing strategy that I was asking Mr. Favell about this morning. So it, it's uh, uh, as um, mentioned in the DSS session earlier today. There are some some requirements under the national housing and homelessness agreement for states and territories to have uh, strategies, but there's nothing that's sort of uh, mandated as such within those strategies. So we've developed a New South Wales homelessness strategy, 2018 to, to 2023, um, which uh, based on the dates, as, as you be aware, will be coming to a close yeah. June next year. So we'll actually be going out for consultation early 2023 to look at the next iteration of that strategy. And um, were you involved in the development of this strategy? I was not, that was before my time. Right, but it's part of your responsibilities now in terms of actions on the strategy. All right. So I've looked at the strategy and, um, and I'm gonna put these general propositions to you. That the strategy itself does not identify people with disability as a separate cohort. Do you agree with that? Uh, so the strategy itself is for people with poor vulnerabilities, which encompasses people with disability. And throughout the document, there are references to people with a disability, mm -hmm. uh, people with mental health, people with mental illness. Yeah. So if you've got that, if you've got the strategy and commissioners, if you have it on page nine, so this is behind tab 20 in the volume, that there's a heading called disability, but it says the National Disability Insurance Scheme, NDIS, provides all Australians under the age of 65 who have permanent and significant disability with the reasonable and necessary supports that they need to enjoy an ordinary life. The NDIS provides an unprecedented, opp unprecedented opportunity for people with disability to live more independently in their housing of choice and the services they need. So that's that's it on a description of disability. So you're aware, aren't you, that not all people with disability are NDIS participants? 
That's that's correct. And I'll, I'll also just uh, reference that when the, the strategy was developed, it was sort of pre, pre NDIS. So we've obviously uh, uh, a lot of lessons learned um, since the NDIS has come into effect and absolutely correct that uh, the NDIS doesn't take into account all people with disability. So the next iteration of the homelessness strategy will absolutely be more reflective of that. Because one of the uh, aspects of this policy was to assist New South Wales to understand the prevalence and the impact of homelessness. Is that right? That's correct. And so that's set out in uh, page nine and following. And there's not a separate heading for disability in relation to those issues, but on page 10, there is a reference to people with mental health issues. That's correct. So, uh, so there's... Uh, the reference on page 10, there's uh, also further reference uh, on page 14. Yeah, there's one on page 10 also to people experiencing chronic homelessness and sleeping rough. So there's a reference to a person who has disability support needs. Mm -hmm. There's also a reference in regional and rural areas that access to disability services could be constrained in those areas. So I think it's fair to say, isn't it, that there's a few references to disability throughout the document, but there isn't actually a definition of disability uh, used in this document. Is that right? Uh, that would be correct. So if we go to the glossary at the end, there's no definition or description of what disability means for the purpose of um, this strategy. Do you agree with that? Yes. Um, one of the difficulties, of course, isn't it, that if you don't have clear definition of, say, disability, that it's pretty hard to work out how this policy is actually going to apply to people with disability. They can have shades of meaning, can't they? Correct. We obviously refer to, to people with vulnerabilities, which encompasses people with disability, which can come in many forms, physical, mental health, mental illness. Mm. So it can be used uh, interchangeably when we refer in the strategy to people with mental health. Yeah, so some people with disability might say, well, having a disability doesn't make me vulnerable, but the circumstances in which I find myself create that vulnerability mm -hmm. and that being aware of disability is important to understand when and how the context might render somebody vulnerable. You agree with that? I do. And the, this policy also uh, has a couple of focus areas. One's prevention and early intervention. And looking at that um, approach, there's no discussion of disability in terms of prevention and early intervention, looking at those areas. You're aware of that? Again, because the, the strategies focused on people who are vulnerable, which encompasses people with disability. And uh, again, if we went through uh, this, one of the focus areas is focus area three, an integrated person-centered service stream. That's on page 25. And that does identify 4% of people reported having a disability in the cohort of people who access the specialist homeless services. Do you see that? I do. So would, would you agree that there was clearly some evidence in the preparation of this policy that there were housing and um, needs for people with disability who were experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness? Would you accept that? I would. And I, I understand that as part of the consultation process for the strategy, um, it included people with lived experience and also some disability peak bodies. And this um, strategy has been reviewed by the New South Wales Auditor General, is that right? It is. And you provided a copy of the Auditor General's report dated the 4th of June, and commissioners, mm -hmm. you'll find that behind tab 22. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Dendall, has the uh, work done by the Auditor General been a factor that has been taken into account in any plans to develop a new and revised strategy? A absolutely. Uh, so, um, as, as I mentioned, we'll be going out for consultation for the next iteration of the homelessness strategy in early 2023, and it will take into consideration a number of things. Uh, so evaluations from some of the current early intervention and prevention initiatives 
funded under the strategy uh, recommendations and findings from the audit report uh, recommendations for, from the commission. So we'll absolutely be taking all of those things into consideration. And I think you've very kindly and very timely provided us a report from the New South Wales Ombudsman, which um, looked at modifying public housing properties to meet the needs of tenants with disability. And this was a process identified through complaints to the Ombudsman. Are you familiar with that document? I'm familiar with the document, um, but the, the accountability for the uh, recommendations does sit with Land and Housing Corporation and the operations arm of the department. Well, some of the recommendations you'd agree from the Ombudsman's report would touch on some broader general policy as well. You agree with that? Yes, I do. And uh, some of the issues are around delay, poor communication, inadequate complaint handling processes. Mm -hmm. Those would be all things that would be within the department's interest. Is that right? That's right. And the uh, Ombudsman made a number of recommendations in, uh, the, in his report. Are you familiar with those recommendations? Um, if you want to have I'm a look at them at page 50. Uh, sorry, I'm just finding that time. The Ombudsman's report is behind tab 27. So oh, page 50 in that report. I want to ask you about any particular recommendation in any detail, but I want to put this proposition to you that um, many of these recommendations go to the manner in which a person is treated with their engagement with the um, social housing system. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, I would. And uh, Ms Morehouse raised yesterday this sort of sense of having to engage with the system or the application processes. So she said some people are lovely, but some people she engaged with, she just had this feeling that um, I think she said she felt like she was treated like a criminal. But in terms of a person-centred approach, which I know you've talked about, how do you ensure that anybody engaging with a person with disability through these systems or processes is equipped to understand the experiences of people with disability and also have effective communication with people with disability. Is there anything that, that the department does and bearing in mind these recommendations could do better? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so there is a training for departmental housing staff in supporting people with a, a disability. So there is in, internal training and resources. There's a, a support resource page on the uh, internal departmental website that's available for staff. Um, obviously noting it's not just uh, departmental staff that support people with a disability, it's also our funded providers. Mm -hmm. So the department funds community housing providers and specialist homelessness services, for example, to, to work with um, our vulnerable cohorts, including people with a disability. And uh, an example of a resource there that's available for specialist homelessness services is uh, there's what's called practice guidelines for specialist homelessness services. And there's a module in that for, for working with people with disability and interfaces with the NGIS. Uh, does the department keep any data of the number of people who've undertaken any training modules? Um, I can definitely take that on notice uh, from a learning and development perspective. There, there should be data available. All right. So a little bit earlier, we talked about the role of the NDIS. And uh, from a New South Wales perspective, how does New South Wales sort of approach the distinction between what's NDIS's responsibility and what's New South Wales' responsibility? We've, just, we've talked about that a little earlier in the context of making major modifications to... Um, to somebody's dwelling, but generally, is there a particular policy setting that sets out the what's NDIS and what's New South Wales? Um, not familiar with uh, one 
cover all documents, so I'd have to take that on notice, but there, there's a, a range of information available. So there's there's the, the APTOS that has uh, principles included, and then I think there's a range of different ways that the department works with the, the NDIA for people who have NDIS support plans. Uh, so a few examples is uh, New South Wales do contribute funding for specialist disability accommodation and supported independent living. Uh, for people who may be accessing specialist homelessness services or um, properties managed by community housing providers, uh, workers would work closely with uh, local area coordinators or the NDIS support worker for somebody if they're on an NDIS plan and living in, in a refuge, for, for, for example, or a, a property managed by community housing providers. Um, the department also has a, a team that's dedicated to working with the NDIA for children in and out of home care. So there's a lot of different touch points with the, with the NDIA. If someone slips between the cracks, do you, do you see New South Wales uh, Department being the, the place of last resort? Uh, the we'll say the intention of the the NDIS in its in establishment was that the, the department wouldn't be a provider of last resort. The department would be wouldn't would not no, be no. So the expectation is, um, and when I say last resort, let's take for example somebody who is homeless or is right on that precipice of becoming homeless. Mm -hmm. um, if New South Wales and the department are not the last resort, then who, who is? Yeah, um, I think it's probably important to remember as well that the department, because we don't provide a frontline service delivery for people with disabilities, so that the 18, um, what was formerly ADAC, that would provide case management, it, uh, no longer exists with the transition to the NDS, but we do fund NGOs, so again, specialist homelessness services for an example. So they absolutely, um, they operate a no wrong door principle. So if anyone approaches uh, a service for support, they are supported into accommodation or case management or whatever support's required or referred on to find that support. So absolutely, um, that, that would apply. All right, so I want to ask you about a, a few more questions on this topic, but perhaps draw your attention to the questions we asked you in para, for question 21. This is page 34 of the statement. And this is about DCJ working closely with the NDIA to plan and coordinate streamlined services. Do you remember that question? Uh, yes, page 34, I've got that. And uh, paragraph 179 uh, is part of the discussion around uh, a task force, a tasking group, is that right? That's correct. Okay. So are we right in understanding that there's a couple of steps in this? First, that the disability reform ministers have prioritised work to improve the supply of affordable and appropriate mainstream housing and NDIS funded accommodation for people with disability. Is that right? That's paragraph 176. Okay. And is it right to understand that that step of giving effect to the priority of mainstream housing, but also NDIS funded accommodation is uh, the process that's then described at paragraph 177 and following. So that's what started in February 2021 with the meeting of the deputy department heads, is that right? That's correct, um, and particularly with the uh, new federal minister, Minister Shorten, um, coming into the role, uh, housing is high on his, his agenda, so it's absolutely a focus of the discussions when the disability ministers from states and territories meet and the interfaces that it has with housing. Uh, so you correct it. Um, Paragraph 179, uh, New mm. South Wales has been tasked with leading what is called tasking group two. two. So there's just a number of uh, 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 outcomes-based work that's been focused on tasking groups. And one of the items under tasking group two, which is looking at mainstream interfaces, is looking at uh, accessible and affordable housing for people with a disability, whether it being social and affordable housing or uh, in SDA. Um, in terms of where that work is up to, um, the group met recently and will be uh, commissioning a, a body to look at, in the first instance, some, some, some good data on supply and demand and need for, for people with disability and housing. 
Has any of that work of the tasking groups been published or is publicly available? Um, I will need to take that on notice. The, um, and in particular, I'd be interested if the tasking group's proposed project plan for housing that's currently being worked through with all jurisdictions in the Commonwealth is uh, a document that's been publicly available. Um, I don't think it's been publicly available, but I will take it on notice to see if we can share it with the Commission. And has the tasking group two, which is the New South Wales one, had the involvement of people with disability as part of that consultation working group? Uh, my understanding as part of the project plan absolutely is the, the intention. So the, the work for tasking group two is very much in its early iteration. So although um, the, the whole program of work came from the deputy department heads meeting in February 21, the work under uh, tasking group two is, is more recent. Um, and uh, there's been one, maybe two meetings to date to progress that work. And there'll be a whole lot of uh, sub working groups across agencies to keep to keep that driving. All right, so I'm going to ask the commissioners, they may have some questions. So my final topic is, and I'm not going to ask you about the detail of the National Construction Code or Building Code Standards. I assume that's not your area. But you're aware, aren't you, that New South Wales is not signing up to the National Construction Code? I am. Will that have any bearing in terms of the work that you do in developing policy around housing and also the experiences of people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Mm -hmm. uh, so although New South Wales hasn't um, signed up to the National Construction Code to mandate silver standards, overwhelmingly a large proportion of new builds in, in New South Wales do adhere to, to silver standards. So obviously we believe in the principle of accessibility for, for, for everyone. Uh, so so uh, Land and Housing Corporation, as I understand it, there's a, a regulation guideline. I'd have to take on notice um, the, the name of, of the actual document, but it's from 2020. And within that, it states that all of their new builds need to be silver standard. Uh, within the department, um, we have some programs that we fund. One's called the um, Social and Affordable Housing Fund. And another is the Community Housing Innovation Fund, uh, that's funding goes to community housing providers. And again, an overwhelmingly large proportion of their new builds are silver standard. There's some, um, I don't know if this is your area or either, but there's a document you've provided us called Housing 2041. Are you familiar with that? I, I'm familiar with it, um, but it's a Department of Planning document. And, it, and is this a vision for housing for New South Wales um, into the next... 20 years or so? It is. So it's the overarching 20-year uh, vision for, for housing for the next 20 years. It sets out, again, some uh, high-level principles and then there'll be a, a range of work that will flow under that. So uh, we currently have in New South Wales the Future Directions Strategy, which is also uh, coming to an end um, next year and we're looking at the next iteration of what the future direction social and affordable housing strategy would look like. So the, the housing 2041 is essentially the overarching principles. Um, and uh, that makes reference to universal design and the importance of ensuring that all construction, uh, particularly with social and community housing, is built in a way that is accessible for people with disability and also older people right? That's correct. Now, yesterday we had a panel. Uh, I don't know if you follow the panel. I did. And you're probably very familiar and may work with some of the members of the panel. Um, but their message was that solving housing might be complex, but it's not impossible. And uh, in terms of a New South Wales approach, what would it take to solve or at the very least improve the uh, housing circumstances for people with disability who are homeless or at the risk of homelessness? What's your view about what needs to be done? Uh, so in terms of current investment in New South Wales, so uh, this financial year, um, the Stronger Communities Cluster, which the Department of Community and Justice sits, is investing $1.2 billion in housing and homelessness initiatives. In addition to that, there's the housing package with the Department of Planning, which is 2.8 billion for this financial year that's looking at 
accelerating new supply, um, first ownership grants, et cetera. So there's definitely the acknowledgement uh, and of the increased need for social and affordable housing. Um, I think the supply constraints is, is no surprises to, to to anyone and I think particularly um, with the, the last few years with the extra pressure points from the pandemic and natural disasters as well but that has also meant that there has been additional investment in in the housing and homelessness sector uh, one of the things that the panel mentioned yesterday was the principles of housing first so that essentially um, is whereby somebody would have access to rapid housing and then wraparound supports are put in place and in New South Wales we've got uh, some good examples of, of that in place, one of which is what we've is called the Together Home Program, and that, that came about in response to the pandemic to support rough sleepers into uh, accommodation with wraparound supports. And uh, the reason I mentioned this is I think it's a, it's a good example of how um, government can work alongside the sector, our state government works alongside the sector and also the, the NDIA to support people with a disability. So there are packages as part of that program which are called high needs packages and currently 40% of people accessing those are people with a disability. So you, I mean that Together Home program set out in the statement at commissioners at paragraph 126 and following and I think the uh, Auditor General also comments on some aspects of that in her report as well. Um, I suppose the question might be if it was possible for New South Wales to respond in a public health emergency to support people who were homeless, but also to help people who may have been on the risk of homelessness to stay in their accommodation, then you know it can be done quickly, can't it? That might be put. Uh, with additional investment, there's always the opportunity to do more. All right, thank you. The commissioners may have some questions for you. Yes. Uh Thank you. I'll ask uh, Commissioner Galvillo whether she has any questions. Um, thank you. I, I'd like to ask you about the Australian Disability Strategy and the outcome area areas and the key system measures. So one of them is average wait times for social housing for people with disability. And, you know, just wondering about um, your progress or do you have a strategy on that topic as a signatory to the strategy do you have a timeline on that do you have the baseline well on the way to being collected so I'm interested in that one there's another one which is the number of social housing dwellings that meet livable housing standards and that's not just new builds that that would include refurbishment of old builds not as reasonable not not as reasonable adjustment but as universal access and i'd like to know your progress your plan your strategy plan your progress and you know the future of those two outcome areas from the ads thanks commissioner uh, to your first question around the australian disability strategy and the, the progress on the outcomes I'll need to take that on notice. Um, I'm, I'm not sure in terms of the, the tracking and reporting of that from a state level, but work that is directly linked to the Australian Disability Strategy is the work that I mentioned earlier around tasking group two and the work that we're doing at New South Wales leading to look at housing for people with disability. So that is directly linked to the, the housing outcome that's referenced in the Australian Disability Strategy. To your second question around uh, livability standards uh, for existing properties, again, I'll need to take that on notice uh, just because the maintenance of properties does sit under the remit of Land and Housing Corporation. Uh, so I will need to take that on notice. Thank you. Commissioner Ra. Um, oh, um, Ms. Dendal, um, just a moment, a thing of clarification. Do you remember back? When uh, in your statement and when you were speaking with uh, council assisting, there was uh, discussion about what constituted a major and a minor, um, uh, a minor adjustment. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be almost a working rule within the New South Wales government that if it's a minor adjustment, it's their responsibility to pay for it. 
And if it's a major adjustment and the person is a, pers a participant in the NDIS, they're referred to the NDIS to get some sort of adjustment. What I was wondering is, um, have you, if that seems to be pretty much a working rule, is there a working arrangement been established between the New South Wales government and the NDIA so that an individual seeking an adjustment isn't sort of working between a jungle of bureaucracy of sort of working out, you know, for example, it, it, uh, of having to go to you, be refused, go to the NDIS, um, they might refuse them and then they're in a rock and a hard place. Have you been able to establish a working relationship where it, there's a, a, an understanding that a person refused by you because it's a major work will be picked up pretty much automatically by the NDIS? Um, thanks, Commissioner. So my understanding is that the work occurs at a local level between the DCJ housing operations and the local NDIS relevant officers, but I'll need to take that on, on notice because it is a matter for our operations arm. Well, do you think it would be a good idea to so that people don't have to go to a wrong door to, to establish that as a working relationship and publish that? Yeah, um, so my understanding is that those relationships do exist. I just can't talk to the exact mechanics of it, so that I need to take it on notice in terms of articulating what that looks like. Um, thinking of the Ombudsman's report um, on, based on complaints about seeking home modifications, there's some discussion about whether or not people need OT um, reports. Um, does it not seem reasonable to you that if a person fronts up to the Department of Housing and wants some sort of modification that would be pretty much solved by compliance with the National Construction Code, for example, a person in a wheelchair seeking to remove the hob from a, a shower um, or the shower screen, why on earth do they need an OT report to do something that is, you know, frankly, bleeding obvious? Is there, is there really a need for people to have, I mean, I, I, I think this does bug people, that they have to constantly prove their disability over and over again and get paperwork for things that do appear to be bleedingly obvious. If I have a wheelchair, it's pretty obvious I'm going to need lower kitchen benches, at least somewhere in the kitchen. I probably want a doorbell that's at a spot where I could use it, etc. Uh, again, my understanding is that there are exceptions for some minor modifications where an OT assessment isn't required. Um, and in response to the Ombuds recommendations, there was a task force that was established between LAC and the department to drive those recommendations. And as I understand it, all are either in trail um, or have, have been actioned. So I can take on notice as well to get an update on those actions. Is there any chance of there being some guidelines which are published to the public so that people with disability would understand that these are circumstances in which I don't need an OT report because there's already a previous agreement between the Commonwealth and the state that a person with a wheelchair doesn't need to continually prove that they need accessible, an accessible house. Yep, I can absolutely take that on notice. There may be such a document that, that already exists that's been developed by the um, operations division, so I can take that on notice. Um, can I take you to the part of your statement at, I think it's two, paragraph 226, where you talk about um, the regulation of boarding houses in New South Wales. And I couldn't help but notice that the number of visits and inspections being conducted to building house premises by the Department of uh, Community Justice has declined by a factor of 45% over the last three years. Is there some explanation for that? And the reason that I ask is you'd be aware that the Act itself was being reviewed. And among the proposals being considered in that review was pretty much handing over the um, responsibility for regulation of boarding houses to the NDIS since most of the people involved were NDIS providers. Is there some evidence that the department is losing steam in interest in, in supervising boarding houses because they're anticipating some future policy where it'll be handed over? Uh, so the, the reduction over those two financial years is uh, reflective of the pandemic and, and also taking into consideration lockdown periods. So there were certain times when visits weren't able to be made due to, to COVID safe principles. Well, have they resumed? You wouldn't be still operating in no, so pandemic situations now. Could you perhaps give us some information on notice that would suggest to us that, um, that, that they are now back at a something that was similar to 2019? Absolutely. So yes, I can um, confirm that, that the visits are back uh, operating still in COVID 
safe ways, uh, but the, the, the reduction in that data over that period is reflective of COVID and predominantly the two lockdown periods in those two financial years. But I can get some uh, up-to-date data for, for to date this financial year for you. Thanks, Mr Chair. What is it about the training or expertise of an occupational therapist that makes them uh, uniquely qualified to make these assessments as to whether adjustments are necessary? Uh, my understanding based on the uh, allied health requirements of an occupational therapist is that they uh, work around fine, fine and gross motor skills. So accessibility for somebody with, within a house, which is why it falls within the remit of an occupational therapist. And they're the only discipline that can make this assessment. Is that the view that's taken? That is my understanding. Hmm. Do you know the approximate cost of an OT assessment of a a major modification for someone? I'd need to take that on notice. It would be some thousands of dollars sometimes, wouldn't it? I'd need to take it on notice. Again, uh, uh, unfortunately, the, the panel that we requested had my colleagues from Land and Housing Corporation and Operations for which the, the home modification sat. One reason uh, for my question, apart from the issues that have been raised as to whether an assessment is truly required in all cases, is I think we heard some evidence uh, that... Uh, there are not sufficient OTs available. Yeah. And if there are insufficient OTs available, I just wonder whether in this broad, wide land, there mightn't be some other people who might be able to do the job, perhaps at a lesser cost. Yeah. Uh, so one of the strategies in response to um, access to OTs was the funding that I mentioned earlier, where the departments invested the additional $2 million last yeah. financial year in this financial year. I understand that. That's an attempt to overcome the uh, shortage of OTs. But I'm, my question is really directed as to whether it's a question of shortage of OTs or whether there's an artificial uh, division of responsibility between OTs and everybody else with OTs being given a monopoly of this kind of assessment. I've got nothing against OTs, no, I should say. I just, just, just puzzling to me, that's all. Um, this may be something you want to take on notice, but let me put a hypothetical to you. Somebody who's in the NDIS, they're living in public housing. They're... De they don't need at a particular time to use a wheelchair, but their condition deteriorates and they do need a wheelchair. And that means that there's a difficulty because the doorways aren't wide enough. What does that person do as a matter of practice and as far as you're concerned to get the doorways widened? What does the person have to do? Uh I will take this on notice so I get the correct information for you as to what the process would look like. Mm. I'm just wondering why in that situation it wouldn't be a reasonable adjustment within the meaning of the Disability Discrimination Act for the state authority, the corporation, to bear responsibility for widening the doorways as distinct from putting it to the NDIS, but you might like to take that on notice and let us know what the practicalities are. Oh, thank you. All right, well then, uh, thank you very much. I'll, uh, is, is there anything that any council wishes to uh, raise with uh, Ms. Uh, Bindle? No? no All right, very good. Thank you very much for your uh, attendance today and for the statement. If you'd be good enough to take the matters on notice, I'm sure that uh, Council will arrange for a timetable for that to be done. Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bendall. Could we adjourn till two o'clock, please? Yes, it's now nearly one o'clock. We'll adjourn till two and resume at that time. Thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. Ms. Dowse. Thank you, Chair. This afternoon, 
we'll be hearing from Ms Lisa Short, who is the State Manager, New South Wales and the Australian Capital Territory from the National Disability Insurance Agency. Ms Short, thank you very much for coming to Royal Commission and uh, for your uh, very detailed statement, uh, which we have all read. Um, if you would be good enough uh, to follow the instructions of my associate who is over there, he will administer to you either the oath or the, oh, the affirmation. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Ms Short. I'll just indicate where commissioners are. On the screen, you can see Commissioner Galbally, who is joining the hearing from Melbourne. Commissioner Ryan is uh, on my left. I'm the chair of the Royal Commission, and Ms Dowsett will now ask you some questions. Thank you, Chair. Ms Short, you prepared a statement for the Royal Commission, as the Chair has indicated, and that's a statement dated the 3rd of August 2022. And commissioners, that's at tab bundle A2, tab 13. There was also a corrigendum dated the 28th of August 2022, in which you corrected the statistics in some of the paragraphs of your statement. That's correct. And that's at tab 13, capital A. With those corrections, are the contents of your statement true and correct? Yes. Thank you. Now, you are, as I said in introduction, the state manager for New South Wales and the Australian Capital Territory in the, for the NDIA. That's correct. And you indicate at paragraph nine of your statement, the responsibilities of your role, and they include managing and leading the functional areas within the operation and implementation of the NDIS for New South Wales and the ACT. Yes coordinating and driving service delivery from a quality of participant experience and a productivity perspective. Yes. And delivery of quality planning outcomes in accordance with relevant timelines and quality standards. Yes. And working across New South Wales and the ACT to plan and deliver NDIA systems and processes that protect the integrity of the participant experience and ensure participants and their carers are provided with consistent high quality experience from access through to plan reviews. That's correct. So if we could summarize all of that, your operations. I'm operations. Thank you. Now you did in your statement provide us with some statistics and I'd like to direct your attention if I could to paragraph 20 nine of your statement. Yes. So, so I'm going to be looking here at paragraphs 29 and 30 and the, the concepts of or definitions of homelessness and risk of homelessness from the NDIA perspective. We see from paragraph 29 that you talk about people who self-report homelessness. That's correct. And that self-report comes from the short form questionnaire. Yes. And you have given us in paragraph 25 of your statement, the options that exist in the short form questionnaire for participants aged 15 and over. That's correct. Are we correct to understand that the numbers you've given us in paragraph 29 are only those people who have answered option K, temporary shelter bracket homelessness, close bracket? And 29, um, no, I believe it's short-term crisis, temporary shelter and supported accommodation and boarding house hostel. What then is risk of homelessness defined for the NDIA's perspective? So they would all be counted as risk of homelessness, um, people living in that type of accommodation, short-term crisis, shelter, um, hang on, I'm sorry, you were correct. <laughs> you were correct, yeah. Short-term crisis or temporary shelter would be homeless and then the other supported accommodation and boarding house or private hotel or hostel could be uh, 
and indicators of risk of homelessness. So I'll just direct your attention to paragraph 30, where you've set out A is for statistics for hostel, B is for boarding house and private hotel, and C is short-term crisis. Yes. Does that mean, because in, in 30, aren't you talking about people, participants who are at risk of homelessness? Yes. So short-term crisis is risk. risk. Not yes, sorry, risk. Does the NDIA have a definition of homelessness that informs that category in the short form questionnaire? Not a definition as such, no. So it's just for people to tell you? Yes. You were following the evidence this morning from the department? Yes, I was. And you would have heard Ms Mitchell say that if a person is at risk of homelessness and they're an NDIS participant, then the NDIS works with them closely and provides them with interim accommodation. And there are a number of actions that the NDIA can take to stop someone falling into homelessness. So I just want to break that down. Does the NDIS provide interim accommodation to someone who is homeless? We can on a case by case basis. Um, so participants who present as homeless, if they become homeless or at risk of homelessness because of their disability, we can provide them with short term accommodation. We would also then uh, put funds in a participant's plan for a specialist support coordinator. And their role would be to engage the participant with mainstream housing and homelessness services to identify a longer term option for that participant. So when you've said that if they become homeless because of their disability, how, do, how does the NDIA assess whether that is the reason they've become homeless? Well, um, for an example, if you have um, a person that perhaps has an intellectual disability and um, maybe autistic, maybe displaying behaviours of concern in the home, um, making the family members feel unsafe. Um, they, um, you know, may decide that it's time that the, the person or the participant lives independently from the family and um, that would be a direct result of their disability. Right. You've provided us with a document called the Escalation and Prioritisation Matrix. Commissioners, that's in volume A2 at tab 15. And that matrix has a, a risk category that's instability of accommodation arrangements of a person. Yes. And at each of the, the levels of escalation and prioritize, prioritization, it, it includes the words, and the NDIA has a role in working with the state services to rectify, so to rectify the, the instability or the yes. risk of homelessness. Yep. How do you work out when the NDIA has a role to play? So the NDIA has a role to play um, to prevent homelessness for our participants by ensuring they have adequate supports in their plan that will assist them to maintain a tenancy, to build their capacity to do things like pay their rent on time, um, keep their properties clean. Um, so that, that's our role in prevention of homelessness is putting in those capacity building supports for our participants to, to prevent them from losing their tenancy or being evicted. And from a participant's perspective, what does that look like? How, how does the support get into the plan? So a range of ways that the, um, if, if on, in the pre-planning meeting, those types of accommodations were identified, if a participant identified that they were in short-term crisis accommodation, that would trigger the planner to have a deeper conversation about them uh, with the participant about their situation and then ensure that there's adequate plans in the funds that are appropriate to assist the participant to navigate the housing and homelessness services um, and to you know, help them explore alternative housing options. Thank you. I've just been asked if you could just slow down your pace of speaking a little so the Sorry. interpreters can keep up. It's okay, yeah. I'll get the warning for myself in a minute. So, so that's if it's triggered in the, sorry, if there's something in the pre-planning documentation that it triggers a deeper conversation, 
if somebody's already an NDIS participant, you, you've told us in your statement that if the NDIA becomes aware that a person has become homeless or at risk of homelessness, it, it can trigger an action. What, what does it trigger? What happens next for the participant when the NDIA finds out they're at risk of homelessness? So when the NDIA um, identifies that a participant has become homeless, the first thing we would do is make contact with the participant or their carer or their guardian or, or whomever we could contact and organise to meet with that participant to uh, look at what plan, what extra funds may need to go into their plan to assist them to um, navigate the homelessness and housing sector. Does the support coordinator assist with that navigation? Yes. And so would that be expected to be a, a proactive role that the support coordinator is involved in? Absolutely. Part of the support coordinator's role is to assist um, the participant to engage with community and mainstream uh, supports. Um, as well as to implement their, their plan, um, connect them with other supports they may have funded in their plan and to ensure they're able to utilise their plan and the way it was intended. You've, you've used the language in your answer then and in your statement about connecting and engaging. What, what is it that the support coordinator does beyond providing the name and perhaps contact details of the mainstream service? So they would walk with alongside the participant in that process. So they would assist the participant to um, make any applications they needed to make for social housing, ensure that the participant understood what the next step was in that process, assist the participant to gain any um, assessments or evidence that may be required uh, to submit to the housing provider, uh, to accompany them to uh, um, look at potential Let's properties. Slow down again. Sorry. Um, accompany them to look at any potential properties, um, assist them to arrange moving in, um, yeah, work with them around how their rent will be paid, assist them with furnish, furniture, all that sort of stuff. We've heard evidence from NDIS participants who indicate to the Royal Commission they don't know what their support coordinator can do to help them. They don't understand the role. What does the NDIA do to provide participants with information about what the support coordinator is supposed to be doing? So after a plan is approved and there's support coordination in the plan, um, the participant attends what we call an implementation meeting. That meeting will either be with the agency delegate who approved the plan, or will be with our local area coordinator from one of our partners in the community. And the role in that meeting is to explain and make sure the participants, you know, aware and comfortable moving forward with what the role of their support coordinator should be and what they can do if they're finding that they're not actually getting the service they require from that support coordinator. Does the fact that some of the witnesses are telling us they don't know what their support coordinator can do for them, if we're hearing that evidence, does it suggest there's a problem in that meeting, the information's not getting through? I'm not quite sure the reason behind that, but I'm certainly aware that there are levels of quality with support coordinators um, around the country and in New South Wales. Um, we, the agency um, provides training for organisations who support, uh, who employ support coordinators. Some support coordinators are sole traders so that they're running their own business. We've recently um, put out a new support coordination framework which identifies for support coordinators what their role is and what the agency's expectations of that role are. Um, the organisations that employ them are responsible for ensuring that their staff are aware of what their role is in the role of support coordination. And there are a range of uh, resources available for providers on our website. Would you accept the proposition that from an NDIS participant's perspective, so someone who is homeless or at risk of homelessness, 
their capacity to get the right support will depend largely on the skill, knowledge and proactivity of their support coordinator. Yes, in some circumstances, yes. And you spoke about that meeting with the, either the delegate who's made the plan or the local area coordinator, the LAC, who's going to explain what the coordinator's role is. What is the NDIA doing internally to make sure that information gets out to the participant through that delegate or the LAC? So again, that discussion's had in the meeting. When we, when we uh, engage a support coordinator on behalf of a participant, um, we send what we call a request for service. So that goes out to the support coordinator and lists and identifies, identifies what the vulnerabilities might be for each participant and outlines what services we expect um, from that support coordinator and how often we expect them to report back to us on their progress. And do you check progress against that expectation? Yes, we do. And how do you do that? We do that regularly when we do check-in. So we, we regularly check in with participants um, in between plan start date and plan end date. Um, and we, we do a desktop review, of course, before we call participants. And that's one of the things that we look at. And so again, I'll just ask you to slow down a little, but these regular check-ins, are these every six months, every three months? That's again, on an individual basis. There are many participants who say, uh, you know, don't contact me till my, my plan reassessment date because I'm fine in, in getting on with my life. Others will uh, want to be contacted more often, but we do have um, on our system, we have, we can identify participants who may be particularly vulnerable that we would call more often for things like if they're not utilising their plan, that would be a trigger um, for participants who have little or no informal support and for participants who might only have one provider in, in providing them with services, we call them more often. For a participant whom you would describe to use your language as vulnerable, what role would that person play in practice in the selection of a support coordinator? The participant? Yes. Yes. So choice and control would, would suggest that we participants would choose their own support coordinator. The agency can, however, if they're not sure, they, don't, they haven't heard of any providers, they're not aware of who a good support coordinator could be, the agency system will allow us to um, select a, a support coordinator for that participant. Is that what happens in practice most of the time with someone who has, for example, Just so people... a significant intellectual disability? For someone with a significant dis uh, intellectual disability, it would often be their guardian or their plan nominee who would choose the support coordinator. Why? Sorry. Why? Why wouldn't the person choose them themselves? Well, someone with a severe intellectual disability may not understand the role of the support coordinator. They certainly could choose themselves if they wished, but often, often it's the, the carer or the, the nominee or the guardian. We would support them to make that decision if that's what they wanted to do. If the agency selects uh, a support coordinator for a particular participant, what is done to ensure that there is a working relationship between the support coordinator and the participant with a view to uh, ensuring that the participant can understand what the support coordinator is meant to do and has the opportunity of checking himself or herself whether that actually happens. We would ask that question in our check-in conversations with participants. Certainly, if there was uh, the participant wasn't utilising their plan, that would be, a, you know, an alarm for us, um, especially if the only funds being drawn down were support coordination and the participant wasn't linked to any funds, any other services. So that would certainly trigger um, a check-in. So conversations with our participants um, around and their, and their carers and families around the quality of the support coordination is very important. 
what happens if uh, the agency forms the view that the support coordinator isn't doing what they're meant to be doing, and particularly in the case of someone who may be at risk of homelessness? So if the agency um, made a dis or determination that, that a support coordinator wasn't fulfilling their role adequately, there's a few things we would do. Um, we would speak to uh, other parts of the business who look after providers and, and what providers do, who would engage um, with the organisation that employs that support coordinator. Um, we would also make a notification to the Commission, um, the Quality and Safeguards Commission, that the quality of service being provided isn't adequate to meet the participants' needs. And what would then happen to change the situation? Well, I imagine the Commission would then investigate and um, I'm not really sure, Chair, what their, their role would be after the investigation. What? Someone who's at risk of homelessness, this sounds like a process that uh, <coughs> is not actually calculated to produce a rapid solution to the accommodation problem, does it? No, Chair, it doesn't. And I thought we were talking about participants generally um, in that question. But, but yes, yeah, certainly if someone is at risk of homelessness and the support coordinator isn't doing their job, we would want to talk to that participant about uh, choosing a different support coordinator. Mm. Sure. Thank you, Chair. So, in fact, my question was about somebody when you had when the NDIA had become aware that they had become homeless, yeah. and your answer began with risk of homelessness. But if we can make sure, perhaps, if your answers today focus on those two categories, homeless and risk of homelessness, yeah. rather than participants generally. generally. So you, you've been answering questions about um, if the, the quality of the support coordination isn't effective or isn't doing what the NDIA expects and you report it off to the Commission and we're having them here on Friday, we'll have some questions for them about what they do. But given that you've described the NDIA as having capacity to appoint a support coordinator, do you appoint a new one so that at least there's somebody doing the job of helping the person who's homeless or at risk of homelessness? Certainly, if that's what the participant wants. We have to take the participant's um, opinion into account um, for choice and control. But if you didn't take it into account in appointing the first one? Well, we don't appoint how the, the system randomly appoints it. It's not, it's not um, a planner choosing for the participant. Um, we can't be um, pointing business to particular providers. So the system um, can generate one that's in their local community um, and that is registered for the type of support coordination or the level of support coordination that that um, participant requires. And so in that emergency or urgent context where somebody has become homeless, it is, as I understand it, the support coordinator's role to assist that person to act to obtain accessible crisis accommodation. Correct. And to assist them to apply for social housing if that's something they wish to do. Correct. Or, or private rental or whatever their situation may be. And in the, the social housing context, to respond to offers of accommodation. Correct. And that would include going on the inspection with them? Yes, in some situations, yes. Um, if the participant required it, yes. And res making requests for adjustments and modifications to a, a property? Yes. And would that include completing the forms? Or assisting the participant to complete the forms, yes and assisting the participant to obtain any assessments that happen to be necessary. That's correct. And those are assessments whether for the social housing or for home modification under the NDIS. Correct. In her evidence this morning, Ms Mitchell said that the that the department um, wasn't the, the last resort provider. Sorry, I'm paraphrasing because I didn't actually write it down in my notes. Is the NDIS the last resort? Are you, are you the organisation that stops people on the pathway to homelessness or helps them recover from being homeless? 
The NDIA is responsible for providing reasonable and necessary supports to participants who are homeless or at risk of homelessness within the framework of our legislation. So the APTOS guides us in regards to responsibilities and it clearly states that um, the provision of housing, social and crisis, social housing, public housing and homelessness services is the responsibility of states and territories. And the agency is responsible for the provision of supports related to someone's disability that might assist them to maintain a tenancy and prevent them from becoming homeless or at risk of homelessness and navigating those systems as well to ensure they can um, secure long-term housing. Why wouldn't Section 14 of the Act authorise the NDIA to provide funding for short-term accommodation itself for people at risk of homelessness? I'm um, Chair, I'm not, I can't memorise Section 14 of the Act, which... Oh, well, let me remind you. Okay. The agency may provide assistance in the form of funding for persons or entities for the purposes of enabling those persons or entities to assist people with disability to realise their potential for physical, social, emotional and intellectual development and participate in social and economic life. Why wouldn't that authorise the agency to provide funds or even to establish its own form of crisis accommodation or whatever that would allow it to assist people who are participants in the NDIS directly rather than require them to go through what for many would be an extraordinarily complicated and difficult process of navigating bureaucratic decision-making procedures. Yes, Chair, I, I think that's a, a, a policy issue that's probably a bit out of my remit, um, but certainly we're guided by the APTOS. It's a set of principles, I know, and um, but it is, is what we have to guide us on you know, the separation of the responsibilities between the states and the Commonwealth. But it's not inevitable, is it? That division of responsibilities between state and the Commonwealth, that's something that, as you say, I understand it's not your decision, but it's something that is a matter for policy makers. Yes. And it, would, it, it would be one possible solution to the sorts of problems, or at least a partial solution to the sorts of problems we've been hearing about for two and a half days. Is yes, that Chair. a yes? <laughs> yes, Chair, I agree. If it, All right. Did you hear the evidence before you from the New South Wales yes, government? Yes, I did. Did you hear the um, Ms Dendal say that the New South Wales government did not consider itself the place of last resort for the provision of of, um, of housing for people who were homeless and had a disability? Yes, I did. So who's um, right? Um, I think I'll leave that for the Royal Commission. Um, I, as far as in my practice, um, the APTOS is, is the guidance and it says very clearly that um, you know, the NDIS is not responsible for the provision of social and public or housing or homelessness services, that that is the responsibility of the states. I'd be really surprised if that issue has not been discussed at a really high level between the New South Wales government and other state governments and the NDIA. Has it not? I, I'm, I'm sure it has, but I, do, I don't know, Commissioner. Well, you would understand, what would you do if you're a... How, how does a participant work out who's going to help them if two pretty senior public servants on the same day can have a different opinion on who's responsible? Yes, I think when we're talking about a participant um, wanting to know who's responsible, um, we wouldn't put that in the lap of the participant. Um, we would work that out between the agency and and housing or homelessness services, and not attempt not to ever involve the participant in that those discussions because they don't really need to worry about who's going to fund it. They just need it funded. If I could perhaps draw on the example of Colin. Now, I don't want you to, to discuss his case in particular, but that kind of scenario, somebody who's been, he's become homeless and he needs a place to be. He's an NDIS participant. He needs accessible housing and he hasn't been able to secure it. He, his evidence, I'm sure you heard earlier this week, is that he is still moving between short-term 
temporary accommodation. That process you've just described in answer to Commissioner Ryan, that the, the government, the agency would work with the relevant state government and find the right solution and not, in, not engage the participant. I, could you perhaps tell us how that should occur in a situation like Collins? So firstly, I'd like to say I did uh, listen to Colin's testimony and I was absolutely um, could not imagine how traumatic um, that that situation in the flood could have been for him and his his sister and brother-in-law. Um, in saying that, um, Colin, yes, an NDIS participant um, after the flood, so in that situation, the emergency services need to go in and do their bit. Um, but post, post the, the flood, the NDIA may, so we're aware of participants in that um, disaster area. We attempted to make, we attempted to make over 900 phone calls to participants in that area. And unfortunately, the telecommunications were down and we were only able to contact, I think, 135. We did put in a, um, in our national contact centre, uh, like if you're in the Lismore floods, press one, that were then taken to the top of the list so we could identify any participants who were in urgent need of um, equipment or might have needed short-term accommodation, um, you know, equipment replacement, wheelchairs and the like. Um, and we, you know, managed to get through to many more. Our, our local area coordinator partner based in Lismore Social Futures also deployed staff to the uh, recovery centres and evacuation centres in those areas to identify any people with disabilities who may have needed support. That I haven't really answered your question. No, so once they've identified them, because, you know, we've, we've got a scenario, so we've identified someone. Your lack has done their job, they've identified them. What next? Where do they sleep tonight? Okay, they sleep in um, crisis accommodation that was provided by the state emergency services initially. We could then put in short-term accommodation or medium-term accommodation into their plan until their house was repaired or if they could return to their previous accommodation. Um, if not, once again, we put in intensive or specialised support coordination to assist them to navigate. And unfortunately, hearing Colin's experience of his support coordinator, um, that's not what should have happened. Back to the crisis accommodation provided by the state, if it's not accessible or all the accessible beds are already taken up by the time you get down to our hypothetical participant, then what? Then I believe Colin was in a, in a motel at some point. Um, it, it's difficult. There was absolutely no accommodation available in, in Lismore. But you do accept the NDIA had a, has a role in those kinds of scenarios and it should have been more proactive than might have been Colin's experience. Should have been more proactive, but again, in Colin's experience, I mean, he even testified that there was just nowhere, no vacant uh, dwelling to to move into, um, and that's that's um, a whole nother uh, level. Yeah. yeah. Now, you you referred in your answer before to you might have provided medium term accommodation. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is that medium term accommodation is only available if you're approved for SDA, but you're waiting for that to come available or you're approved for home modifications and you need somewhere to live while that takes place. Are you saying medium term accommodation is available in other scenarios? Well, in in times of disasters, I'll, I'll give you an example. Back in, during the COVID, COVID pandemic, pandemic, the government made um, some allowances in regards to supports that participants could draw down on their plan from. So things like PPE, um, you know, different supports for when people were in lockdown. So in times of disaster, we certainly would, if we were aware of, if, if we're aware that the participant requires medium-term accommodation while their home is being uh, fixed from a disaster. That's certainly something we'd look at on a case-by-case -case basis. 
And in that scenario, would the agency do an own motion plan variation or reassessment and just get that money in? You wouldn't need a change in circumstances for no, the person? No, we just get it done. In... Stop me if I already asked you this question because I flicked back in my notes, but did I ask you about SDA accommodation? No, I don't think so, Council. Thank you. Uh, in the context of talking about SDA this morning, Ms Eastman asked whether the Commonwealth was in the business of building how NDIS housing and Ms Mitchell said that that would be a question for the NDIA. So can you tell us, is the NDIA on behalf of the Commonwealth in the business of building SDA accommodation? No. What does the NDIA do insofar as SDA accommodation is concerned? So the SDA provides funding for a participant to live in an SDA property. So it's a, it's a uh, incentive to encourage developers to uh, invest in specialist disability accommodation. Um, and it provides our participants with a safe and secure access to their own home, um, especially when, uh, you know, the cost of renting such an accessible apartment would be way outside of what a participant who's eligible for SDA could afford. So does it come down to this? The NDIA will pay the rent on an SDA accommodation? Basically, yes. Right. You said basically, is yes, there a nuance yes, that we need to understand? Definitely, yes. Right. And the other times that the NDIA will literally pay the rent is medium term accommodation? Yes. And the, the short term crisis accommodation? Yes. Are there any other scenarios in which the NDIA pays the rent? There's individualised living options um, that may pay, um, may pay a portion of the rent. Now, these ILOs, as they're known as, are not my specialty because they're mainly developed in Western Australia. Um, but I believe there are, there are two levels of that. We can uh, fund a, um, like to begin, uh, to explore an individualised living option for a participant. And then we can fund a, um, you know, a housing solution. So it may be that somebody, um, a housemate situation whereby that's an increase in informal support and the NDIA may subsidise the rental component of the housemate uh, living in, in, in there. Um, it could be a neighbour who's prepared to provide a range of informal support or drop-in support and the, the agency can fund some of that. So, because they're individualised and basically in Western Australia, I don't really have a live example to give you, I'm sorry. Why would this be limited to Western Australia? Well, it's not limited. It, it, can, it is happening now. It's starting to happen all over the country. But the Western Australian government started that um, design of that model um, before the NDIS. So a lot of that has continued. So, so Western Australia is very familiar with it. Um, New South Wales providers are just starting to, to explore it. So if you get ILO funding in your plan and you have stage one, as you said, it's the design and exploration phase. Somebody comes in and looks at what's the right support for this participant. Then stage two, implementation. I accept what you've said about you're not familiar with this, but presumably the capacity to implement relies upon there being a provider and a dwelling in which the, it can be provided, the supports can be provided. That's correct. So the participant and the provider would work closely together to design what the, what the model might look like. And it may be the case, isn't, is it correct to say that that um, design and exploration phase my, may determine that ILO is not the right option and you should be in supported independent living maybe for some capacity building. Yep, possibly. 
When the NDIA is making its planning decisions, deciding what is a reasonable and necessary support, what's going to be included in the plan, do you have regard to the availability of accommodation options that are consistent with those supports? No, we don't take that into account. Um, we, we, we put the reasonable and necessary supports in the plan. So if a participant gets approved for an ILO, but there's no provider available and there's no building available, what happens next for that participant? So the support coordinator would work with that, that participant to explore other options. That it could be that the participant might be willing to move to a different area um, or might move closer to family. Um, there'd be a whole range of, of you know, options that they would explore as part of that exploration package. Shouldn't that happen as part of the planning rather than after it's in the plan for, for a thing that can't be delivered? So we wouldn't know that what the participant wants couldn't be delivered until after they've explored that with, um, with the provider or with the um, support coordinator. So a participant might say, I've heard about these individualised living options, I'd like to apply for, for that we'd put the exploration and design funding in their plan first. Um, and then when they had identified where they want to live and who with and how it's going to work, then we put the implementation funding in. There's no obligation on a participant to identify the kind of support they want, is there? There's no obligation, but they can. Participants yeah. often want to choose who they live with and where they live, um, and that's perfectly their right. Absolutely. But what if they what if their goal is a little more general? I want a stable, secure home. Give me any option that gives me that. So we'd explore, but what does that mean for you? What does a stable and secure home look like for you? Right. Yeah. And then you would have an assessment around that. Yes. And you would build a plan. Yes. And if the plan can't be implemented, the support coordinator needs to come up with another one will needs to work with the participant to find an alternative, but we would stop, wouldn't stop um, seeking um, the model that the participant prefers. Except if there's nowhere to deliver that model, because that, that's what we're trying to examine, what I'm trying so to sometimes examine. Sometimes an, an individual living option will allow a participant to access private rental, whereas perhaps on their own, they wouldn't be able to access that. Is it your experience as the state manager for New South Wales and the ACT that there is a lack of housing, there are a lack of accommodation options available for NDIS participants? Yes. And would you agree that the lack of housing contributes to homelessness and the risk of homelessness for NDIS participants? Yes. They become homeless because there's nowhere for them to go. That's correct. Does the NDIA have a role in providing advice to state and territory governments about the level of demand for housing? Yes, and we do on a regular basis. Uh, we meet with New South Wales government at all different levels, um, at the local level, at the system level and policy level to talk about uh, issues such as that. The local level of the New South Wales government. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Sorry, the housing, you know, the local housing office. Right. Yes. Yeah. And when you say you meet regularly, is, is that monthly, quarterly? Um, at the local level, I think it would be um, on a case-by-case -case basis and regarding a particular participant, so resolving an issue for a particular participant. Um, at the system level, uh, we meet with, I meet with New South Wales government bi-monthly um, and talk about a whole range of issues, um, housing and homelessness being one of those. Um, and at the systems level, at the policy level, our state relations branch meet with um, senior officials from New South Wales government regularly as well to talk through some of these issues. So I want to change tack now and ask you some questions about applying for access to the NDIS. So we're almost going backwards a little. And we asked you these questions in the, or asked New South Wales the questions in the notice your statement responds to. And I'd like to direct your attention to paragraph 44. So 
So we had asked a question about whether the NDIA provides funding or other support to a person with a disability who is experiencing homelessness to obtain medical or other assessments to support their application for access. And in paragraph 44, you say that not all access requests require evidence in the form of written assessments. And I just would like to understand how that paragraph fits with your paragraph 42C, where you talk about accepting statements from prospective participants and their support workers as secondary evidence in addition to medical evidence. It sounds like medical evidence is always required. In order to gain access, um, a person, a, a, a prospective participant needs to um, meet some criteria. Um, the first criteria is they must be uh, under 65 years or under. They must be an Australian resident. Um, they must have a permanent and significant um, disability relating to um, one of five domains. Um, which are uh, physical disability or impairment with mobility, with self-care, with self-management, with communication or with learning. So um, in order to prove a permanency of an impairment, um, evidence from a medical practitioner is usually required, like a GP, um, um, because we, you know, access delegates in the agency can't make an assessment as to whether someone's um, impairment is, is a lifelong impairment. Right. So the question is, uh, is a written assessment always required? The, the answer is some degree of medical evidence. Some it's degree of medical evidence, yes. And you go on in paragraph 44 to say that um, in some cases where a person with a psychosocial disability is applying to access the NDIS. Evidence of a repeat history, uh, sorry, evidence of a history of repeat homelessness may be accepted by the NDIA in lieu of a formal functional assessment as part of the justification of the substantial reduction in capacity. What is evidence of repeat homelessness, given your answer before about there's no definition of homelessness other than a self-report? So um, evidence of uh, a history of accessing crisis services. So it could be a letter from um, a homelessness service to, to outline the history of access for a particular participant to those services would be, would be evidence. And who decides whether the formal functional assessment is requ required or whether that letter from the service is enough? So the access delegate would make that decision. They would look at whether they have enough information in front of them to make a decision on access. If not, they would request further information to enable them to make that decision. Right. You talk at paragraph 42B and 49 about how with the consent of the prospective participant, the NDIA can contact their support workers or health professionals to obtain evidence in support of the application. That's correct. If a delegate isn't satisfied on the basis of the evidence that a prospective participant has submitted and consent has been given, does the delegate contact those people before making a decision to reject the access application? Generally, yes. In what circumstances wouldn't they? if they had enough information in, in the, the written evidence to suggest that the participant wouldn't make access. Um, they may not make a call, but generally they would. Um, and I have made those calls myself previously. So there's something in the material provided that satisfies the delegate, you, that this person, this prospective participant is never going to satisfy the access requirements. Well, there may be uh, not enough written evidence that the delegate may want to question the health professional about, ask, ask for more information, which, and if they can do that over the phone, they would rather than request the participant to go back to them for more information. Um, perhaps you misunderstood my question. I was asking, I thought you had said there are some occasions when a delegate would make the decision to reject 
without making that phone call. Oh, yes, 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 there would be. If there, if, if there was absolute evidence that the participant won't make access, they would do that. Now, the chair asked you some questions earlier about um, Section 14 of the Act, and he, he hopefully read it out to you. But you have also referenced Section 14 in your statement, and it appears in footnote 19, but it's in answer to the question about evidence gathering and supporting a prospective participant to obtain the assessments that they might need. Now, my question is, how is the availability, the potential availability of funding under Section 14 communicated to prospective participants? I'm not sure if it is. Access isn't actually my part of the business. Um, I have uh, dealt in it many years ago, but um, I'm not actually sure. So can I take that on notice, please, Council? Uh, you certainly can, and you may need to take the next couple on notice, but I'll keep going. What's the application process if you want to use Section 14? Once again, yes. Right. And in paragraph 47, you note that when a potential participant's application has been designed, declined, the LAC can support the prospective participant in gathering evidence to seek review of that decision to decline. My question is, does that assistance include getting them some Section 14 funding to get their medical evidence? I'll have to take that on that. I thought you might. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Just to put uh, qu uh, paragraph 44 in context, you were asked about that by Ms. Dowsett. And uh, I Paragraph 44 indicates uh, that evidence of a history of repeat homelessness may be accepted by the NDIA in lieu of a formal functional assessment as part of a justification of a substantial reduction in capacity for self-management. That, I take it, is a reference to one of the criteria set out in 24.1 of the Act that a, an applicant must satisfy before a plan can be approved. Yes. Chair. So that what you're referring to is the third of the requirements, namely that the impairment result in substantially reduced functional capacity to undertake or psychosocial functioning in undertaking one or more of the following activities, communication, social interaction. So homelessness, repeated homelessness can provide, I think you say, as part of a justification for satisfying the third of the requirements. Yes, Chair. But it is not capable of being used to satisfy any of the other requirements. Is that the way I should read 44? For example, yes, if, some, if so. someone has had repeated periods of homelessness, would that not be an indication that the person has a disability attributable, for example, to cognitive uh, impairments? Yes, Chair, it could. It could. And is that what happens in practice? Yes, Chair. Um, the, the reduction in capacity for self-management could, could indicate a range of, um, of impairments, yes. Yes, I see. All right, thank you. And does that evidence come to the NDIA through the, the service? If, uh, if a homelessness service is connecting, to use your words, the, the prospective participant with the NDIS, they know to send them along with a letter that talks about how often they have accessed the service? So when a participant submits an access request form, there is a, a evidence of disability form attached to that. Now I'm going from my memory here. So um, that is where that information could be provided on that part of the form. And you have referred in your statement to the, the ability of a prospective participant to make a verbal application. You say that you don't have to fill in the form. Yes, you can make a verbal access request. And when you make a verbal access request, it is still the case that you then need to send in the evidence package that supports that access request, isn't it? It's not all done on the phone. Um, I don't have any experience with verbal access requests. So can I take that one on notice, please? Yes, please. So 
I'm going to move on to the, the final set of topics that I have for you today, which is about SRSs. Now, I, I preface this by acknowledging that you are from you're the State Manager of New South Wales and the ACT, and that supported residential services are a Victorian thing. So I won't be asking you questions specifically about how the SRS scheme works, but I do want to ask you questions about how the NDIS intersects with that scheme. So if there's something you feel is a little too SRS-y, please just say if you can't answer. So the Royal Commission will hear evidence in the next couple of days about the SRS scheme. And we understand that there are approximately 4,000 people who live in SRSs in Victoria, and about a third of them are NDIS participants. I want to run through, if I can, a list of potential reasonable and necessary supports, things that the NDIS might fund for a person that might also be provided by the SRS. Now, you won't be able to answer the second bit. We'll have other witnesses who do that. But can I just run through this list with you? So under the heading of personal care supports, would the NDIS fund assistance with daily hygiene that might be showering, bathing, brushing hair, brushing teeth or dentures? Yes, it would. Would the NDIS fund meals, the preparation and cooking of meals? That would be on an individual basis. If, um, the, if the SRS did not provide meals and a participant was required to cook their own meals but was unable to do so because of their limited function, yes, the NDIS would fund that. Perhaps but I wasn't clear. Just forget about the SRS for a moment. Just does the N NDIS fund as a reasonable and necessary support the things I'm going to list to you. So okay. the cooking of meals, can you get NDIS funding for that? The cooking of meals, yes. Um, Ms. Dowson, these questions don't really have anything to do with the SRS, do they? I mean, you, 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 you're wanting me short to provide evidence as to what the NDIS will fund, but that's independent of whether it happens to be associated with the uh, <clears throat> SRS or not. Uh, perhaps I have confused the point. You've probably Chair. confused me, um, so not necessarily anyone else, but anyway. So what I'm seeking to do with this piece of the evidence is establish what it is the NDIS funds. Yeah. It will go together with some evidence you will hear right. from a different witness about what the right. SRS. Right. So we can ignore the SRS for present purposes. Yes, please okay. do, Chair. All right. So we, we did meals. Um, assistance with eating, so actually having your meal, is that something the NDIS yes. Toileting and managing incontinence. Yes. Dressing. Yes. Managing medication. Yes. Accessing healthcare providers. Yes. Laundry, cleaning your clothes. Yes. Uh, cleaning bedding, linen and towels. Not the provision of that, but the cleaning, yes. Yep. Cleaning of the house, like, so um, yes. cleaning your bedroom. Yes. Bathroom. Yes. Kitchen and living area. Yes. Outdoor areas. Yes. Um, maintenance, repairing broken windows and doors. Not generally. Accessing the community. Yes. And... Providing support to improve living skills, for example, um, money and household management. Yes. Behavioural management. Yes. Yes, thank you. So within the NDIS framework, is there a person with responsibility for ensuring that a person who receives funding for a particular support actually gets the support? That's a difficult thing to monitor, Council. Um, if the NDIA becomes aware that there are some concerns that a provider is 
being paid for uh, support provision that they're not providing, then um, our, our LAC partners and our planners internally would refer that matter to our fraud under our Chief Risk Officer Division, um, who would investigate that matter. Um, we would also, at the same time, make a referral to the Quality and Safeguards Commission because um, of services, you know, much needed services not being provided to participants. And you may not be able to answer this because it is, I'm now picking up the SRSs. And so people who live in SRSs have residential and services agreements and they have ongoing support plans. To your knowledge, is there anyone within the NDIS that looks at any potential overlap between those two sets of documents to see whether a person is receiving the same services twice? That will be difficult. Um, I believe in the SRS, the participant pays for their board and lodging to the SRS provider from their disability support pension, uh, which we don't have oversight of how they spend their disability support pension. Um, the agreement between the SRS proprietor and the participant is between those two parties. Um, the NDIS has no part in that. Um, However, we're aware of some issues with um, participants residing in or have resided in SRSs. Um, we have the ability now to put an alert on every participant's um, record who resides in an SRS, and that alert will alert planners to um, be talking through these issues with participants when they're doing their check-ins um, to try and prevent any of that. Um, and if we become aware of that, we would report that directly to the human services regulator who regulates the SRSs in Victoria, as well as the Quality and Safeguards Commission. When did that alert come into effect? When did it start happening? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure. That's Victorian team. So um, Can you take we'll that take on that notice? on notice. Absolutely. Thank you. And in the, you said that um, this might this alert might trigger during their checking conversations. Is it also part of the planning conversation to say, to invite the participant to share their SRS documentation? I, I accept you have no oversight of them, but the participant might share that with you so you know what they're getting? Absolutely. That would be a question that we would ask, yes. I want to now explore the issue of plan management arrangements. Now, so this is when, uh, perhaps you can explain, plan management. So there's three types of way a participant could manage their plan. They could be agency managed. And if they're agency managed, they can only use registered providers, that is providers who are registered with the Quality and Safeguards Commission. Um, they can use, uh, they can self-manage. So that means that they manage all their, their um funding and their providers themselves and they pay the providers directly. Um, if they are plan managed, they have a plan manager, which um, then pays their providers um, based on the invoices providers um, give participants. And if a plan is plan managed, is it correct to say that the NDIA doesn't have any oversight or any capacity to see who is providing the services, the supports to the participant? Generally, that's correct. We, um, there is a recent requirement for um, plan managers to um, put ABNs on the system of invoices they are paying. Um, so that gives us some oversight, but not all. Um, our new PACE system that's coming in into um, that we're rolling out at starting at the end of the year will have much better ability for us to capture that type of information um, readily at hand. If they have an ABN to put in? Well, if plan, yeah, that, that we'll be able to drill down onto the ABN and get information about who the provider is, but it won't necessarily tell us when supports were provided or um, or what supports were provided. 
So it's difficult for our system to capture, basically. The only information you see at the moment for a plan managed uh, payment is that the money goes from the NDIS to the plan manager. You see the description of what the serv what the support was, yes. but all you see for who the payment goes to is it all goes to the plan manager. Yes. And you don't see who that gets dispersed to. Well, the plan manager records the ABN of the company that it's being dispersed to. Under the new system or under the current system? Under the current system, I believe. I will take that on notice because I'm not 100% sure. I'm pretty sure it is a new addition to our current system, but I will take it on notice. All right, so by new, you, it may be in force now. It may be, but I'll, I want to give you an informed answer, so yes. I will check. Could we please have, as part of your answer on notice, the date, if it is in effect now, the date upon which it came into effect? Yes. It. Thank you. Now, as part of that change to the information that the NDIA is capturing, will you have the capacity to see if an NDIS provider subcontracts to, to an SRS proprietor to provide the, the NDIS funded support? Once again, I'll need to check that for your council. Now, you spoke a little while ago about an alert system that is put on the plan for every resident of an SRS. That is a participant, yes. Who is an NDIS yep. participant, yes. In paragraph 64 of your statement, you referred to an alert that is triggered. I think that's the right paragraph. Uh, yes, paragraph 64, NDIS planners are also notified through a system alert when plan utilisation is irregular, such as if funding is being over or underspent. Yes. Are there similar alerts triggered if there is a change in participants address? We wouldn't be aware of a change of a participant's address unless we were notified. Um, and then that the change of address would just be changed in the system. There wouldn't necessarily be an alert to that. We understand from some information provided to us by the NDIS Commission that the NDIA doesn't always have a record of a participant's address. Is that correct? Some participants use a post office box or they use um, prefer to use um, informal supports address. So but once again, I'll have that checked for you, Council, sorry. And can you also check whether for all of the NDIS participants who are SRS residents, whether that is necessarily recorded, if you have that information? Yep, certainly. Back to the triggering of alerts. Are alerts triggered if there's a change in a support coordinator? No. If there's a change in a plan manager? No. And if there's a change in an NDIS provider? No. Some evidence was given by Dr. Pierce, the Victorian public advocate, in public hearing 22, it's in public hearing 20, about an NDIS participant who had been moved from an SRS to some private rental accommodation with $600,000 in their NDIS plan. And in the space of seven months, that money had been spent and the resident, the NDIS participant, was facing eviction. What triggers should have been alerted in the NDIS to let you know about the move and the spending of the money? Or is that not something the NDIS, NDIA should have been alerted to? Yes, we certainly should have been alerted to that council. Um, there may have been an alert regarding the overutilisation of that that plan, I, I imagine there would have been alert on that. And that alert should trigger our check-in, at least a phone call. However, um, sometimes with participants in SRSs, um, it's the SRS provider that answers the phone and um, can make it challenging to speak to a participant. What can the NDIA do if it becomes aware of some of these changes and it wants to explore whether the change is the result of the genuine exercise of choice and control or coercion of a vulnerable participant? So we'd want to talk to the participant about that. Um, we'd also refer that to our uh, Chief Risk Officer Division in our fraud 
and investigation team, and also to the commission, um, because that would require an investigation that um, the commission would undertake. Right. And if you are concerned uh, the, that the participant has in fact been coerced, is there anything more you can do other than those steps you, you've just pointed out about where you'd refer it to? What can the NDIA itself do? Again, we put specialist coordination of support in the plan to ensure that um, there are eyes on that participant and the participant has access to someone to advocate for them um, to, to stop the coercion. Just excuse me one moment. Just have one last question for you. Uh, have you seen this, the joint statement that was prepared by Ms. Mitchell and Mr. Favell? Yes. So you may recall that in that statement, um, they referred to an investigation of a $500 million underspend, of, uh, five, $500 million SDA underspend what can you tell us about, firstly, what that underspend means? Well, I think they explained, not really an underspend, their explanation was that that was an estimate made by the Productivity Commission as to the expected cost of the program, and it turns out to be $500 million less. If that's the correct explanation, it's not really an underspend. I know that's what they said in the statement. But anyway, if you know anything about it and whatever this means, please tell us. Yeah, I don't really counsel, but there's something that I can take on notice for you. I'm not sure that the numbers provided by the Productivity Commission in 2011 have necessarily all stood the test of time. We don't need you to take that one on notice. Okay. We just wanted to see if there was anything further you could add to to what we'd already heard. Uh, Chair, those are my questions for this witness. I now hand her to you. Thank you very much. Ms Short, if you don't mind, I'll ask my colleagues if they have any questions. I'll start with uh, Commissioner Galbally in Melbourne and ask whether Commissioner Galbally wishes to ask you some questions. Um, thank you. The, the question I'd like to ask is about specialist support coordination and whether everyone at risk of homelessness would have a specialist support coordinator and who, how do, who, are, who are they and where does one get one from? Thanks, Commissioner. There's um, three levels of support coordination. There's um, level one, which is sort of support connection. So it's uh, very basic aimed at just linking a participant in with um, community and mainstream. Level two is support coordination, which um, is more intensive and more of a wraparound support. And then specialist coordination is a higher level. It's paid at a higher level. And it requires the support coordinator to have specific knowledge of navigating um, mainstream systems and supporting uh, participants to navigate um, complex mainstream systems. So everyone who had was would be identified by the agency of at risk of homeless or homelessness certainly should have access to a specialist support coordinator rather than just a general support coordinator. And would that be the same for everyone in an emergency situation like Colin? Would they have a specialist support coordinator? Holland's support coordination was already in his plan during, you know, prior to the flood, but I do believe Colin has an upcoming um, plan reassessment date booked in whereby, yes, he will be offered specialist support coordination. But there's no um, system at the moment for when there isn't an emergency of that kind to just automatically upgrade that role. Um, on the grounds that it's going to be very tough and you know tricky for people with disabilities. Absolutely, but yeah, you're right, Commissioner, there is no current system for us to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Um, thanks. Look, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about paragraph 25 of your statement, which relates to self-reported information from particip NDIS participants about the sort of housing they live in. And I notice a couple of the options 
Um, option D is large residential, less than 20. And the other one, a small resident, uh, sorry, greater, greater than 20 and small residential, less than 20. Um, to the best of my knowledge, large residential centres have been outlawed since 1980 and should have been being closed. What is the NDIS doing funding people for SIL living in large residential centres and should there not be a plan to make sure that that stops happening? Yes, Commissioner, this, um, this list in the short, this short form outcomes framework questionnaire um, was developed during um, trial and transition and probably does need to be updated. So during that time, we were actually exiting uh, participants from large residential centres, which is why this is identified here. Um, but you, you're quite correct, that needs to be updated and taken well, off the list. Do we have people living in large residential centres still in Australia? Uh, because I, I, my observation is, I've seen a couple in operation during the course of the Royal Commission operating. I suspect that some of the SRSs we're going to talk about later in the week constitute large residential centres. Are you able to tell us that they're gone or that you have a plan to remove them? Well, I know that there are some SRSs that have over 20 people. So if um, they're considered a large residential centre using that that term, but um, I'm I'm not sure. Large residential residential centres come to my mind as the old, um, you know, the Stockton Centre or the, um, you know, those those large institutions that governments have been working hard to close. And and uh, certainly they're all closed in New South Wales. But um, if we're including SRSs in that. Um, definition, then you could assume that some able, still exist. Are you able to give the Royal Commission an assurance that there wouldn't be people you're providing SIL support for that are living in residential centres that might have 15 or 20 people living together? Because I have a feeling I've seen one or two. Yeah. I'm not sure whether this witness can give that assurance or... Um, yes, right. I think that's right. Well, no, I don't think it's fair. You, Thank you, I Chair. Ask me short to give an assurance. Well, could you provide on us behalf us? of the uh, Australian uh, NDIA, the Australian government, or anybody else? Fair, fair, fair enough. But could you provide information as to whether or not the NDIS is aware of whether there is there are still large residential centres operating in Australia that would would have closed by now um, under arrangements that existed before the NDIS commenced? Because I think I've seen a couple, okay. um, one in Tasmania that's got 40 odd units all clustered together on a site that's very close to a garbage dump. Um, and um, there are some legacy models that have been left over in earlier attempts to close large residential centres that resulted in significant clusters of housing all located together. I, I'd like to know whether the NDIS is aware of that or not. Um, and if they could provide the Royal Commission with any information about them. Certainly, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, we may have been given information about this in one of the uh, 25 earlier hearings, but if so, I don't remember. You've told us about the three categories of support coordinators. Uh, what are the, is there some kind of registration requirement for each of those categories? How does, or yes. can the same person do all three or how does it work? No, Chair, the same person couldn't do all three. So there's uh, registration in, in the framework for support coordination that it outlines what skills and qualifications we would expect from a specialist support coordinator in particular. So people get registered according to their category, whether they're category one, two or three. They may be registered for all three, but they need to ensure that the staff that provide that service are um, paid at the higher level. And that's why we provide a higher higher cost for the specialist support coordination because we expect a higher level of skills and experience and qualifications. So in any particular instance, a support coordinator who's allocated to someone like Colin might in fact have the qualifications for a special support coordinator. We'd need to inquire in the particular case whether that is so. Yep. Yes, yes, I understand. Thank you. Mr. Chair, could I just ask one other question? Yes, uh, paragraph 118 of your statement refers to what people would uh, need to do to get necessary and reasonable home modifications. And one of the requirements is a suitably qualified occupational therapist has performed an assessment and recommended home modifications considering all possible alternatives, including the use of equipment. 
Um, you, it looks like the NDIS has the same obsession with occupational therapists that um, <laughs> New South Wales um, Disability has, or New South Wales uh, CG, what's it called, Community and Justice Department has. Is it absolutely necessary for a person always to have an occupational therapist, which is a considerable amount of money and time to get one of those, to make quite often a submission to the NDIS, which would be to get housing, which would qualify for the silver level NCC, um, and the person, for example, might be using a wheelchair, and I would have thought it was the bleeding obvious that they needed those modifications. Certainly, Commissioner. Um, the NDIA doesn't require an OT assessment for minor home mods and adjustments like handrails or, or ramps, and participants can purchase that, that stuff through their um, core supports. What about the removal of a hub, um, a, a hob in the shower? For yep. example. So at the moment, we do require an op occupational therapy assessment for those reasons. And I think the role of the OT is to be able to assess a participant in their environment um, and, and recommend better ways that a participant or things that could assist a participant to be more independent in their own home. So um, the, the agency at the moment is considering, or well, the government is considering allowing um, lower cost home mods um, to not require an assessment by an OT at all that the participant can, can um, organise for those um, minor modifications to occur without the need for an assessment or a quote. Oh, I wouldn't mind extending the scope of that project, but I applaud it. Could be a practical example of competition policy in action. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Short, for giving evidence today and for the detailed uh, statement that you have provided. We very much appreciate uh, the assistance you've given to the Royal Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, Commissioners, the final witness for the New South Wales part of the hearing is uh, some evidence provided by Dave, which is a pseudonym. And I'm pleased to say Dave is here with us in the hearing room, but uh, what we might do is just show the pre-recorded uh, evidence, but I don't require Dave to come up or present himself to you. All right, thank you very much. We'll, we'll have that evidence uh, now. You don't need so I'm happy this morning to be talking to Dave, which is not your real name, but we're going to go with Dave. Is that all right, yeah. Dave? And Dave, we're down here in Newtown, and we're in the inner west of Sydney, and this is an area that you know pretty well. Yeah. So Dave, can I start? Tell us what your story is. Well, um, I first had some contact with the mental health workers when I was eight or nine because yeah. of my parents. And first time I lived in boarding house sort of style accommodation would have been when I was about 16. But a, How did you get into boarding house uh, at 16? Divor divorced, um, living with a father on a pension. Uh, that was the accommodation he could afford. Hotel style accommodation, I assume it's the same sort of thing as a boarding house. Mm. Very similar in every respect. Uh, and then, you know, when I go well, I get a flat. When things, uh, when I get, uh, stressed out, run down over time, um, back to the boarding house. And of course, as time goes on, the gaps between jobs just gets longer and longer. And mm. Now I'm over 60, really, um, you know, just looking for the finishing line. Oh, Dave, so can I take you back a little bit to when you were a teenager? What could you? Uh, so do you remember what it was like at school, if you had mental health problems at school? What was that like? Well, they didn't re it, nothing resembling problems that I was aware of really hit year 11. And mm. I'm a bit of an isolator. I come in, I do enough to keep the system off my back and then I disappear. Mm. So what did you do when you finished school? Did you uh, uni working? for a while. I got a couple of credits in first year arts. Yeah. Too unstable. Um, by then, even the father had pissed off, so I had to support myself. Mm. Uh, didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah, drink it too much as well. Um, so I got out of there and got a job, and was pretty much self-supporting on a more yeah, pretty much self-supporting there. Aren't they? What sort of jobs have you done in your life? Our oh, first phase of the career, public service jobs. I've worked for State Rail, Australia Post, Department of Social Security, Department of Government Stores, um, 
the Navy, um, maybe one other, two others. That was sort of phase first third of my working life. Second third, I managed to make a go of some stuff a bit left field in called performing arts uh, in schools. Um, worked myself to exhaustion mm. after 15 years of that. I was totally mm. close to collapse physically, mentally on every level. The last, that's another third, the last third has been call centres, mm. mostly charity fundraising stuff. Um, but even with that, I, you know, the jobs get further and further apart. Mm. I become less and less employable. Um, but uh, you have to be a social isolator, so... Mm. Tell me about some of the them. places that you lived in, because I think when you uh, chatted to me before, there's um, in and out of hostels and boarding houses. Not hostels, yeah, fortunately, not hostel. I haven't so, got to the hostel. Yeah, we talked about hostels. Yeah, we talked about but, yeah, boarding but, houses. Yeah. Not the, to me, they're not the last resort. Yeah. Last resort is couch surfing, yeah. temporary hostels, or the park, yeah. uh, or prison, because and a lot of people <laughs> go in and out. And, th and that's not been your experience? I fortunately managed to avoid all of those. And so most of your living has sort of been in different boarding houses? And boarding house to flat. Um, things? Well, this one has been. I've been there mm. for 15, 16 years. Mm. And fortunately, as a good landlord, uh, it has had a nice... Until recently, it had a good stable population. Mm. People, all of these are old buildings and old housing stock, but it's the people that make a difference, whether they've got their lives together or whether they're running right. I think you said the human environment is yeah. more important than the sort of physical environment. Yes. What does that mean? Well, if you can get on with the people, house? if you can get on with the people, leave your door open without fear of being robbed. Mm. Um, if they're quiet, they're not violent and they're not thieves, mm. um, then you can live in peace and mm. you know, if you live together long enough, you get to know each other. And, and a lot of the people you would live with at different points in time also had disabilities. And well, we talked about you know, how you work out whether somebody has a disability or you identify yourself in that way. But I think you've told me that that's well, sort of something of, you've seen. I think everyone who's passed through the place has, has at the least been really unlucky in their family life. Uh, but a couple have had heart surgery followed by minor issues mm. which stop them working again and mm. get older. A mm. um, couple have come out of prison with you know, usually drug issues before they go in. Um, we were lucky, you know, we had a run of people who managed to clean up their lives and stay out of trouble but they're mm. never getting out of the boarding house except maybe to the houses. Mm. Um, yeah, quite a few people have Probably half of them have prison in their background with mental health issues. We have one at the moment with autism spectrum and uh, been hit by a bus as well and can't keep himself out of petty crime. Um, got a couple of social isolators. There's one guy there I've said six words to maybe in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, he just doesn't seem to... He's not unfriendly, but... He just doesn't want to talk to mm. people, doesn't want to deal with people, only comes out at, when necessary. Um, but he's five foot tall and very lean, so I don't know what's mm. got on in his mm. life story. Uh, I've got a got Koori guy pushing 70. A um, couple of these guys have been sort of functional alcoholics. Mm. You know, they pay the rent, they keep their lifestyle together without getting mm. into trouble with the law or their neighbours. Um, yeah, that's functional enough, mm. isn't it? And you've told me that you really like reading and although I've been watching a you've few got a bit of gardening TVs going, and, happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. How does that sort of help you in your life, doing those sorts of activities? Does a that give you sort of sense of... A lot of, of poverty is really yeah. mental. Yeah. It's what you can think of. I mean, one, one of the guys... Uh, Got his two dollar fifty pensioner ticket. Spends the day on the trains yeah. and the buses. Goes, to, yeah, he's Indonesian. There's a big community of them around Kensington. Mm. So he goes over there, bumps into people, mm. talks language, has a nice little lunch. Mm. Goes to the Bondi. Yeah, you know, takes advantage of this mm. beautiful city. Mm. Um, yeah. But other people seem to have nothing in their head but their grievances. Mm. Mm. Uh, I noticed that with the worst of the mental health cases. 
some of them just going in a mental cycle of their grievances and looking for those patterns to reappear. So is the NDIS, is that something that um, is part of your life or no. you've heard about for the guys that you live with? One of the guys has been through the, the whole system and got his pension and some NDIS component. It did, look I don't like dealing with the system, mm. um, uh, so just to go through all that now, I, I would happily forfeit hundred bucks a week to avoid okay. all that. So what's but the, yeah. um, some of the older ones, you know, you try it. They're, they're set in their ways. Mm. It's great that these services are offered, but if they you know, they feel that they're pushed on, and, mm. nah. I'm into it. Not so into what it. sort of supports are around? Is it local? community or neighbourhood I really, supports? I really don't know because as I said the mm -hmm. only one who, who's gone through that system uh, it's all too complicated he keeps telling me I should try it and I'd close my mind to it and but I, I really just wouldn't he, he loved mucking around and reading all that stuff mm -hmm. and I just wouldn't want to um, and it's a bit of an admission of defeat mm -hmm. certainly not for me because I'm just borderline this or that mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm functional enough to stay mm. out of major trouble. Mm. Um, I changed my lifestyle before my health collapsed. Mm. You know, I did not have that heart attack or stroke. Mm. Mm. These sort of things. It sounds like you, you so, sort of look after yourself and make decisions for yourself. And well, I'm still capable of that. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I, really, I respect that there are a lot of people who can't. Mm. Um, while I can, it's my last bit of freedom, so mm. the... You know, being self-managing is you know, my last shred of self-respect. Mm. Commissioner's also sort of keen to know what what do you think needs to change to support people with disability who you know don't live in the sort of average or ordinary housing and their housing might not be so stable. What do you think would make a difference from your own experiences, but also the folk around? Uh, the neighbourhood centre where we are today. Now, what do you think um, the Royal Commission should know? Well, first of all, you've mentioned the neighbourhood centre, mm. so this sort of resource where if you want to meet people or they want to meet you, you are there uh, literally three minutes walk from my home and there are a lot of boarding houses around here, so you're very close to a lot of your target audience. That ex yeah. accessibility for those who need it. I, I'm from, a, like most of the, most of the, not all, the boarding house demographic I'm old and set in my ways you know there are a couple of younger people and transgender people who've been through but by and large you're old and set in our ways and um, having enough money to pay the rent a few few luxuries and to stay out of problems with society yeah. for me personally I'm a hardcore tobacco addict so the, the price of t mm. <laughs> government policy on tobacco affects me um, but the, the services being there but not sort of pushed on them. And for the serious, for the people who seriously need these services, I, I can't, you know, I have a thing about these service providers as an unnecessary, I haven't experienced them in the NDIS, but where I have experienced them, they're unnecessary and useless. You'd be better off just giving the money direct to the people who knew how to spend it. Instead of subsidising something, you know, if you give them an extra 100, 200 a week, then they can come up to Sydney. They can actually afford to do that more easily. Um, just seems, you know, like unnecessary. Yeah, I'd let the free market go on that. Mm. Just impact. The last thing they ever seem to want to do is empower the people. We saw it in Aboriginal affairs with however many years of all the money going to white public servants and white landlords and white consultants and by the time you get to the ground there's nothing yeah. and that sort of um, unskillful. So I sort of really take a grassroots approach to go yeah, to the people? Is yeah, that... keep these services on the ground. I mean, if the day comes and I want to know, you know, want to know about these things or my circumstances change and I think I need to know about these things, you're just here and this what do they call it here, the one-stop shop, mm. is far less intimidating than going into, say, the Department of Social Security mm. and asking questions there or doing things on the phone. Mm. Um, very accessible. Mm. Well, Dave, absolute pleasure to talk to you today and thank you for your time and sharing your story and um, talking to us at the Royal Commission. We really appreciate it.
Thank you, Commissioners, and um, thank you to Dave, who I can see in the Yes, thank you, well. Dave. I don't know where you are in the audience, but thank you very much for doing that extraordinarily interesting interview with uh, Ms Eastman and giving us uh, the benefits of uh, your experience, uh, which uh, you put very clearly, if I may say so. So, Commissioner said, um, completes the New South Wales part of the hearing and tomorrow we'll turn our attentions to Victoria. So if we adjourn now, and as I said earlier, the Royal Commission's hosting an afternoon tea for some of the services that support people with disability in Western Sydney and everyone is invited. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll adjourn until 10am. Uh, the Royal Commission is adjourned.